What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Yala. Uh, Today is another one of those special episodes, Terence. Special in the sense that every time we do the mic test, you always like talk so softly. Then suddenly, <laughs> you get so excited about your next guest. That's why you start talking so loudly. I have to readjust everything again. Yeah, that's why. That's why we are a team, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's special because it's not just Terrence and I. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a lot of stuff happening in the news, but the person we have today, we have on today, is someone who's always on the pulse of Singapore's news. Yeah. In fact, he is, he is the mystic himself. <laughs> yeah. I call him the mystic because he, he's able to predict what happens to in the yeah, news. Yeah, he like. predicted or like in, in it, like talked about the possibility of dear Sugar Daddy Hang stepping down from his position as finance minister and as PM. early as November 2020. Yeah, he man. put it down on paper already. Yeah, on paper. Exactly how it would turn out, and that's exactly how it turned out. Yeah, and you look at his article; it's almost like he wrote it play by play. Yeah, yeah. And he's sitting right in front of us, listening to us as we talk, wax lyrical about him, mm. and he is none other than Mr. Sudhir Vadakath. More commonly known as Sudhir TV. Welcome, Sudhir. Yay! Thanks, thanks, Yay. thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> so, Wait, the TV, so the TV is literally the an acronym for your middle name and last name and all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, my full name is Sudhir Thomas Vadekit. Mm. Um, it's a uh, first name is kind of a North Indian Hindi name. Uh, mm. Middle and last are like South Indian mm. Malayali names. Mm. So I'm like, this long bloody name my parents gave me finally came in useful when I started doing video. So mm. to, be, like, to be honest, when I saw SudhirTV.com and like the videos, I was like, is this guy trying to do the thing that was cool like 15 years ago <laughs> where you put TV behind the name? That's like, oh no, those are his initials. Because we also started as Ministry of Funny TV. Correct, correct, correct. Right? Yeah. This was back in 2014 because everyone was doing that. Like the founder of Twitch uh, was Justin TV or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, but but no, it's actually. Oh, you mean you know, it's, it's no longer cooler? Uh, I, I, no, bro. I, I thought it's still cool, it's man. No, so, man. It's nobody so bloody told me that. Nobody watches TV anymore, man. <laughs> yeah. It's Sudir TikTok. Yeah, uh, t- that, that exactly. Sudir TK. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Shit, man. Sudir TK. I'm gonna fire my social media manager. <laughs> <laughs> so so you are you are a writer based in Singapore, right? And I mean, um, what we wanted to talk about today, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in the news with regards to politics and social, but uh we met you for the first time a few weeks ago. Mm. I think you and I connected on Facebook last year during the elections when you kind of started making videos about the political scene and all that. Yeah, you're going viral, bro. Like people who didn't know that I was watching your videos, were sending me your videos and like, hey, this guy's mm. cool. Then I checked it out and like, yeah, it, 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 it was a very, very nice uh, coverage of the elections. Yeah, yeah. So then we connected and then, yeah. So, so what, I mean, like, what, what made you want to take the step in like to create videos? What was the first videos you created on your own? Yeah, but feel free to redefine uh, what Sudia TV is. Yeah. Like, I'll properly define what Sudia TV is yeah. for everyone. Because I think we... We've been just laughing at the name, but then actually the yeah, content of it, like <laughs> let's let's just give our audience the proper introduction. Yeah. Uh I I don't really know what how to define it properly because it just started off as a fun blog mm. um, 17 years ago, I think, or 16 years ago. And I think uh, I was on Blogspot initially and, mm. and I just, you know, used that used that uh the, the the other title I have is Musings from Singapore, but then you know mm. Sudhir TV is is the URL that I that I use, right? Yeah, and it just kind of grew from there. I I, I think now I've started to incorporate more videos since I started doing video about a year and a half ago, mm. and so there are different bits of the blog. I mean, it, it's still mostly a written word. I I, I say because that, that that that's still where, what my forte is. That, that that's what I've been trained in. And over the past couple of years, I've been trying to transition to different mediums, but it's still mostly a lot of text. Uh, mm. I'm trying to put more photographs and videos in, but I, I would call it like, I, I guess I'd call it a, a digital magazine of sorts. Uh, you know, mm. maybe at, at, at the core, it's still a blog. It's a personal blog, but you know, yeah. I, I, I've tried to build it out a little bit, make it a bit more uh, aesthetically pleasing, I guess, uh, mm. with, the, with the options that WordPress give, gives me. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's it's just essentially a digital magazine, 
my thoughts mostly on Singapore, but but also on other things that you know I've written recently about Maradona after he passed away. Mm. Uh, I, I I love writing about people. I, I wrote about Anthony Bourdain and I, I wrote about my my late friend Lee Yang Su, who was one of the co-founders of this restaurant called the Coconut Club in Singapore. Mm. So um, it's it's you know I, I think people in this country tend to know me a lot for my political commentary, mm. but I would say that my preferred genre is sort of travelogue writing about place and people mm. Mm. so so i think you know recently i my first book was a book on singapore and malaysia where i, I cycled around malaysia and, and and wrote a book about the two countries so that's a lot of you know on the ground interviews with people and the foods i'm trying and the places i'm seeing i recently wrote a piece on passe ris which is my new hood mm. you, know, you, you recently moved out i i i moved out uh three years ago mm. so fun for my wife Li Ling and I to finally have our own place but 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 I, I, I wrote this kind of sort of love letter to Pasir Ris mm. uh, a few weeks ago on my blog so it's a mm. sort of a long form essay that incorporates a bit of history of Pasir Ris and Singapore in the 1900s uh, all the way till today and, and, and I would say that's probably my kind of preferred form of writing and commentary um, mm. But of course, I mean, because I write about politics and, you know, politics tends to be exciting in a country where there are not that many independent mm. political commentators, you know, so, so I think that's what people know me for. Sorry, mm. I, I'll, I'm, I can go ahead with your question. Why, why did I get into video? But, but did you guys want to? No, because I mean, part of it is also understanding your background. Because yeah. I mean, when I first saw your articles, I was like, hey, uh, I will admit that sometimes when I read uh, articles from people who are anti-establishment, Sometimes it's a little too, too speculative for me, and like it loses loses me halfway. But when I read yours, I was like, "Hey, this guy actually sounds legit." And um, I found it interesting given the the landscape in Singapore where you don't get people who are that vocal. Yeah. So yeah. So I know you studied. You like you grew up in Singapore. You spent time in the US. You yeah. did your degree there. You did your masters there. Yeah. And then you worked for the Economist. Yeah. Correct. Uh. But, yeah. But your background when you studied was what? Like, well, what did you study? Wait, sorry, I, uh, Harish, I, I, I don't really like the, the word anti-establishment, so I, I, just, need to, I just need to correct, correct that. He really I, set it up. I, He's I, setting it up. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for uh, you to trip. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, sure. so I, I like to say that I'm non-establishment uh, or I'm mm, non-partisan an important correction. or I'm independent. Mm, mm. Um, you know, if, even if you... And, 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 and I, you know, the... The broader picture, I think, is that in Singapore and 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 many other illiberal democracies around the world, uh, you know, I think there's there's often an effort to paint opponents of the mainstream or opponents of the of the of the ruling party as somehow anti-establishment, but it, it's not really the case, lah. You know, and, mm. and 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 then the 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 very common leap that is then made after that if you're anti-establishment you're anti-country right so anti-establishment mm. necessarily becomes anti-singapore so there are a bunch of people we paint into a corner as anti-singapore and and you know i'm 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 nowhere one of the one of the doyens of of, of the people who've been who've been caricatured like this you know pro yeah. probably the most famous is somebody like pj Tum, right yeah, <laughs> who gets caricatured as anti anyway so i i'd say non-establishment uh or independent or non-partisan is probably probably a better way to put it mm -hmm. um Plus the fact, plus the fact, if you're going to be actually very technical, I mean, people always tell me I'm I'm anti PAP, but you know, I've never actually once called for the PAP to be out of power. Yeah, mm. I've always said I want the PAP in power, but just bloody reduce your <laughs> gigantic majority you have because I yeah. mm. I don't think it's healthy for the country. Anyway, so you know, the, the 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 joke I tell is that in any other country, I'd be I'd be I'd be called a. a uh, majority party supporter, right? We call it a yeah. PAP supporter, but in Singapore, people say I'm anti PAP. Anyway, anti <laughs> uh, establishment, anti establishment. <laughs> but, yeah, but 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 you 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 asking about uh, after after I came back from from university yeah. and, I mean, and moved well, to Singapore. Actually, can just, elaborate more yeah. into your background, like how because you you strike us as I mean. Um, we're not saying that we're in the same category or anything like that. Like we we talk about politics and things like that. Uh, also from a, as, as much as possible, non-establishment mm. uh, position as well. Uh. Yeah. But at, at heart, we are content creators. Uh, you know, we grew up on social media and all these kind of things. Whereas what I'm hearing from you is much more, you know, you're classically a writer, like, you know, Pico Ayer 
kind of like that kind of uh, a writer writer yeah. like, you know so I much prefer Terence to you at the moment <laughs> by the way you were like anti-establishment you're like putting no. me with Pico uh, what, what no, uh, no that's why we have uh, it's, it's all about <laughs> the dynamic <laughs> you know okay, it's good call bad call <laughs> yeah, yeah. no no but, but I mean it, it is like, like if people ask you how you became content creator it's a very you, we have very practical answers for it like, you know whereas like now like to really talk to a writer writer or someone yeah. who sees himself you know as first as and foremost as a writer you know how how do you get into this like, without all the but all the things about chasing your passion and all that but really how how was it your how do you come to realize that was your lifelong calling um i i i've always i've always loved writing right mm. i mean from the time I, I i remember winning my first essay competition when i was it's just just within my my little St. Andrew school, but you know, it still meant something to me at a young age. Mm. Um, when I was eleven years old, I think. And so I've always loved writing. You know, um, there are very few things in life that give me as much satisfaction as as just stringing a nice sentence together. Mm. And in many ways, you know, now now that I'm kind of middle age, I guess 40, 43, um, and 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 I have conversations with my mom about about these things, about career and about you know career choices. I actually feel very, very lucky and fortunate mm. that the thing I really enjoy doing is also the thing that I do on a daily basis and the thing that somehow earns me a living. You know, mm. it, it took me a while to get to this stage of writing, earning me a living. And, and, and you know, we can talk for days about all the challenges about being a, a writer in the internet era. But uh, I, I, I do feel very lucky. It's just like, at at its at its base, it's it's just something that gives me pleasure. So, for a long time, you know, having grown up in Singapore, I never thought of it as a feasible career. Mm. I just thought this is something that other people in crazy hippie countries do. You know, <laughs> uh, 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 it, it'll always be a hobby of mine, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 but yeah. I'll have to do something practical to yeah. to get by. And when I moved back to Singapore in '05, I I was still looking at you know, quote unquote, more practical jobs. Uh, and then in April of 06, so about nine months after I moved back, I got a call from somebody who's like, hey, we've got this interesting position opening up at the Economist Corporate Network, which mm. is a sister unit of the Economist magazine or newspaper. So yeah, I, you know, very, very lucky. I, I was just lucky that this kind of mm. chance came to me. So... Mm. And then, you know, that was 2006. Then it Sorry, was... Sorry, that was a... Was that a journalist kind of role or... Yeah, so I... I it, journalist slash analyst, you know, I, I, mm. I, I, I guess it was more sort of um, political, economic analyst yeah, see, would, would be a more accurate description. Cause, okay. so, I, so I wasn't like a, you know, classical journalist with a, with a beat and, and something like that. Okay. But, but, I, but I worked for a unit that provided senior level advisory service to governments to companies, to organizations around Asia. Mm. And so my role was to basically write on economics, on politics, mm. uh, on business developments in Asia. And, and, and that would be sent out to members of the network. Oh, and you, al you always had an interest in that sort of areas? Like, like for example, the essay award you won when you were younger. Um, like how, what sort of stuff did you like to write when you were young? And how did that evolve? I forget what I wrote about lah. Um, probably something making fun of my friends or something. I, uh -huh. I forget what I wrote about, but mm. but w w my interest in economics probably started in JC. Mm. Uh, I, I I took it. I, I took econs and I took econs S as well, which is the higher level paper, which was a lot of fun actually. It it, it wasn't it. Th that was the one subject. My my econs S paper at A levels was the one subject I thought was open and fun and creative, right? I could, you could kind of read and do whatever you wanted as opposed to all the other bloody subjects where I was like, must you know, I must be a child mugger and you know, yeah, yeah. memorize mm. shit and all that. So so I think um, I, I had an interest in economics. I, I had an interest in, in politics from a long time ago. You know, I think political awakening happened in, in different phases. Happened when I, when I, when I read Francis Xiao's book, To Catch a Tata. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard about this book. Um, Francis Xiao, for for your listeners who may not know, was a Singaporean politician who ran for the Workers Party, I believe, against the PAP. Yeah. And and then you know eventually he he became an exile in America. Um, 
and and he wrote this this book which which I never saw over here. You know, I I think you can get it, but I never saw it here then. But I I read it for the first time in America to catch a Tata, um, something in Lee Kuan Yew's prison or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you read it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, read it. Um, it was basically about his detention in the yeah. Thompson mm. barracks, right? Yes. Yeah. Because he was representing some of those, uh, the 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 so called communists in our in our system. I mean, legally representing some of them. Yeah, I think he got into trouble for a yeah. few things. Then, then you know, I think he was accused of of uh, assistance from the U.S. or assistance from the West also because he was a he was a good buddy with the U.S. ambassador to Singapore. Mm-hmm. And then there was this whole, correct, correct, yeah. you know. The usual, you know, uh, trotting out the foreign yeah. interference uh, yeah, accusation yeah, yeah. against mm, against right. people. Um, so, yeah, th- I, I read that in the nineties in Berkeley when 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 I was in school there. And then uh, another part of my political awakening, I guess, was I, I came back and I volunteered at at, at Meet the People sessions mm. at at mm. Ulu Pandan with uh, Vivian Balakrishnan. Oh, Vivian so, B. Yeah, wow. Vivian yeah. B. Vivian B. Vivian yeah. B. Wow. Yeah. We, we, we haven't spoken for a long, long time. For, you volunteered for, or for you For different were... reasons. But, but <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, you, you volunteered or were you uh, no, volunteer, drafted uh, volunteer. or were you picked? Volunteer, were you... volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Volunteer. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Volunteer. See, see. So that that was when I was doing my master's. Uh, so during my my holiday breaks, I would come back and I would I would help out. You know, you, you kind of do the same thing. Like, I don't know whether yeah. you guys have been for Meet the People sessions, but but... You know they they are they are held once a week usually. Mm. It's an opportunity. I, I I think in some ways it's a great thing. You you don't find it in many countries. It, it's an opportunity for anybody at all to meet your senior most political representative. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know it, it's it's a nice thing in a way to have to have that that contact point between constituents and and politicians. At the same time, you know I think you 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 get a lot of people with a lot of different uh, very basic problems that you always wonder why. A politician is needed to actually solve these things, right? Uh, um, you know, a single mom who who can't pay her electricity bill or her rental or getting her lights shut off or, or you know, HDB won't won't offer this to this person. And that whole experience really opened my eyes to people at the bottom of society. You mm-hmm. know, and it was very powerful for me because up till then I had you know lived in my usual sort of slightly atas bubbles la, right mm-hmm. you know uh, Raffles Junior College then I went to nice nice university in America and army of course army was a bit different uh, army you know that that's the one nice thing I think about army um, um, uh, is, is is the social equalization part you you yeah. hang out with people from across the social strata but but I think um, volunteering at MPS 03 to 05 that that really you know because I, I would actually interview these people as they were coming in so yeah, my, yeah. my job was to just prepare a little sort of like statement which which the minister or, or the politician or whatever could then read and sign off on lah mm-hmm. right they, they used to use it as a as a as a means to send letters of appeal to the different agencies and stat boards hdb yeah. and all that on yeah. on behalf of the constituents so so that, that was also part of my political awakening to answer your question i i uh, I don't know whether I really saw myself as a political writer or, or as an economics writer. You know, th- those are just things that I had an intellectual interest in. Mm, yeah. mm. And I, I, I often say that my first love was geography, right? Human mm. geography. So not physical geography, but more human geography who look, looks at mass movements of people. Um, I actually, one of the favorite things I wrote when I was an undergrad at, at, at Berkeley was my uh, geography honors thesis which mm. was on Burning Man. So I don't know whether you guys oh, yeah. ever went yeah, to Burning Man. I don't know when, but I know of. Yeah. So I... I, I Did I, you go? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been three oh, times. And hippie, the, bro. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hippie Max, <laughs> right? Atas, atas hippie, yeah. You went three times? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, fuck, that's Max yeah, hippies, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Isn't it like super atas? I mean, now, you, 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 you know the joke that they now tell about, about burners, right? Like, like how, 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 do you know, how do you know if somebody went to Burning Man? I don't know. They'll tell you. Oh, they'll tell you. And case in point, lah. Case in point. No, but, but you probably I kind of went found to a way it. to angle it with my writing. But yeah, so so let me tell you. I, so the first time I went, yeah, first time I went, I actually uh, won a small scholarship from Berkeley from my geography department mm. to study it, quote Oof. quote unquote, study it. <laughs> so I, I I classified it as um, uh, the largest New Age pilgrimage. So 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 one as one part of human geography is the geography of religions. Yeah. 
and and that just looks at how religions have developed and and another subset of that is pilgrimages mm. right so you look you look at you look at the hajj and and you look at things like human movements uh, animal movements because you know, lots of animals are slaughtered and brought to the hajj and all that um so that's that so so pilgrimages fall under human jog and, yeah. and, and, and and so you know burning man so when i went for the first time in 2002 i think i've been running for 25 years i think the first was in 87 so so maybe just to give context to people who are listening who are not aware of burning man my understanding is that i mean i know now it's probably at a very different state from what it was uh, uh, when it first started but it's just yeah a congregation of people who go to the nevada desert right yep. you bring all your old own essentials there's no currency there everything is butter trade yes it's uh, there's art installations there's music and it's just like a community that pops up for what seven seven days yeah and then after that the rule is no trash and all and they just leave lah right yeah. Yeah, why why the name burning man uh because i know there's a there's something at the end that's that's burned i don't know what the the, the, the history yeah the effigy of this huge man lah but i don't know what the history of it is um i know that it's it it used to be much cooler Mm. Actually, I guess it's still cool. Or do you feel like a bit like am I am I insulting Burning Man? No, Your it, inner it's, Burning it's Man coming out, commercialized no, no. now. Yeah, right? now it's now it's gone down that path, lah. Right, like to go there is fucking expensive or something. Elon yeah. Musk is right. There, but no. at two, in two thousand two, was it you went? Yeah, that was probably like it was. It was still cool. It was. It was not well known, but it was. It still had that that that. Uh, how you say a uh, gravitas, lah. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So so that's the context of of Burning Man. Uh, yeah. But you were saying that when you went. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think like anything in this world, when you know, when, when, when you go there for the first time, it's, it's a new experience for you. Mm. The old timers will always tell you, oh, you know, you should have seen it back in the day. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 wherever yeah. you go in the world, it's the same thing, and, yeah. and it, it's true for Burning Man as well. So, two thousand and two, when I went there, you know, it, I think there were twenty seven or twenty seven thousand people. My, my, my first time. Mm. Now, now it's you know sixty seventy. Yeah. I think. Clo- coming close to hundred thousand as well. Yeah, so, yeah. so obviously there were old timers who had been going since eighty seven, since it was a small thing on the San Francisco Baker Beach when they first burned the effigy of a man, which is where the name comes mm-hmm. from. Mm-hmm. And and the whole idea about that is 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 uh, transience. You know the 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 lack of 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 attachment to material objects, mm-hmm. way, which is a very strong value of of burners, mm-hmm. right? Don't don't you know. Place more attachment on relationships and and other things rather than material objects. That, that, yeah. that's, that's a very strong value there, which is why they burn a lot of shit. Um, which 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 uh, is sad sometimes. You know, they they yeah. build these amazing yeah. creatures and then they yeah, burn yeah. it. Yeah. But w- when by the time I went on my third trip, which was in '09, so it was th- that was fun because I went with my sister and my brother-in-law and a bunch of other friends from Singapore. Mm. Oh mm. man! Yeah, we we brought like black sotong curry there and gave it away. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, we we had long lines of burners like waiting for our black sotong curry uh-huh. from uh, Rajas curry. It was it was a lot of fun. But mm. but mm. by then, I I did start to feel that that exactly what you just described. Like it was becoming more commercial. Mm. Um, you were start you were starting to get camps because the the ethos is very open and you know sharing and and you 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 just display your art or in our case food for everybody else yeah, yeah. so you see amazing art there but already in 09 i was starting to 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 run into camps where there were people who were who were restricting their their mm. entry of the camps lah uh. mm. So you you could see aspects of uh, a regular city kind of popping up in Burning Man already. So so I think by two thousand and nine, yeah, I was I was uh, there's a part of me that's losing interest. I mean, my my mom always keeps bugging me. She wants to go. Oh, serious? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Um, and I I I met some some you know quite a few people in their seventies and eight, even eighties yeah. when I was there. So there there are older people who go, but it's a very harsh environment yeah. as, as uh, you all know. So yeah. uh, I I I don't feel like going back there. Just because I I feel like I've 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 done it a few times now and I, I'd like to see other things. But if my mom ever wants to go, then I might just go back to Burning Man. Mm, but anyway, the yeah. point I was making is, my 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 the thing I wrote about Burning Man that that's that's the kind you know which which looks at the society and the values and yeah. um, I, I I followed a bunch of pilgrims, which included my cousin-in-law from Phoenix, Arizona. So I drove with them. I, I helped them prepare, get their van ready. I, you know, because mm. you, you had to bring tons of water, right? You you can't yep, you can't yep. get water there. 
uh, prep everything, and then I, I followed them back. And 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 even the journey back is interesting because you you kind of decompress, and you know Burning Man is such a weird place that you know you 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 need some transition back yeah, to regular yeah. society, right? Yeah. Not not everybody is hugging you and telling you they love you and <laughs> in the yeah, regular yeah, world, right? Yeah. Um, so so writing about that experience, I mean, that's the kind of writing I really love to do. Mm. Uh, you know, so so the political writing, the economic writing, I, you know, yeah, I have an interest, I do it, but it's not, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's my number one passion. La. So how did that thesis go? You killed it? Uh, I, they, they, they enjoyed the writing, but they, they, there were several people, both in Berkeley and, and I'm sure outside as well, who really didn't like me calling Burning Man a religion or, or, oh. or just, or just um, studying it with that framework. Yeah, because you know? when you said you followed a, a, a group of pilgrims, I'm guessing they don't refer to themselves <laughs> no, as pilgrims. No, 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 no. Yeah. But in your yeah. mind, they were pilgrims. Huh? <laughs> I mean, they've been making the same bloody trip, you know, like, like, like you know, for years. So yeah. it's, it, the, the, I, there are a lot of similarities, I feel, you know, yeah. between between um, burners and, and pilgrims of, of religions. So then, then what made you want to come back to Singapore? Because, I mean, Singapore, we have, what, uh, Speaker's Corner. Uh, <laughs> what else... NDP, you know, mass congregation of people. Yeah, yeah. But if you were I, exposed I took, to... Which I took part in twice, by the way. As what? <laughs> I, when I was in school, I was one of those bloody flashcard boys, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's one of the things that, while I'm happy, like, I never got bogged down with NDP rehearsals, you know, I've never been part of an NDP, you know. Neither in army nor in primary school. Terrence, you can have for army, right? Uh, yes, I have directed traffic at NDP before. Oh, is it? I mean, oh. Ami la, Ami, you are free labor, right? They yeah, yeah. So, so my second time was when I was in Armour, la, my first uh, year in Armour. I, I, mm. I, I marched in the parade. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, in a way, it's them shack because uh, from, it your from like March right? yeah. to yeah. August, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 you, yeah. you burn your weekends, la, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you have uh, but, ha- half but, a day. But did it bring back memories of Burning Man or not? <laughs> <laughs> no, la, the only yeah, thing you're burning is weekends. Yeah. Burn weekends. I mean, <laughs> but there, 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 there is there is an aspect of like uh, grinding it out with a community of guys, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, everything I'm hearing, you know, is taking place within this like five to six year period, the 2003, 2009 thereabouts. Huh? Hmm. So you are going to Burning Man, and you know, like basically disavowing material possessions and all that but you're also volunteering at MPS sessions where people are like please give me like you know $100 to pay off this thing you know yeah how do you how how was that reconciling in your head uh? like in terms of just where you wanted to be in life and where did you see yourself at that point in time uh? Hmm. because I I think it's it's them it's both are very interesting things to do volunteering MPS and then also going for Burning Man but it's two different kind of ethos or were you at MPS also telling everyone you love them (laughs) like (laughs) woo The yeah. pilgrims, the pilgrims. pilgrims. Fuck the pilgrims. <laughs> 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 Chill out, man. Throw, throw away your old stereo. Burn it up. <laughs> no electricity. Okay, lah. Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's, that's where, how it's meant to be, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but because you, you said you had political awakening, so but there were seem to be like two, you know, two threads that could have gone I mean, down. Uh, Terrence, I, I, I don't think I really thought it through much, la, you know. Mm, mm. I was just doing shit, doing. Uh, experiencing shit mm. that you know, I was young and I was just doing different things that I thought was interesting. I I, I don't think I necessarily yeah. thought it through too much. Okay. You know, I I, I did Burning Man because I I thought it was fun and interesting and and you know in many ways it's it's the polar opposite of Singapore, right? Mm. If, if you think about the social norms so. and everything else. Um, but MPS also, I I I think I I don't know how I initially got got into it, but I I certainly very quickly came to appreciate it for uh I I guess in a way. It, now that I think about it, there is a similarity. Like it just uh, opening my worldview to people mm. who I wouldn't uh, uh, ordinarily meet, lah. Right? Mm. That's true. That you know, I, true. I I wouldn't ordinarily meet these these people in in Gimmo who are really struggling with their bills month to month. Man, I mean, not, none of my social circles like that. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe so. in that sense, I was just you know experiencing different people and, and meeting different people, lah. So when you say political awakening what, what what does that mean for us because I, I think yeah like harish for fun fact harish has had a beer with francis Xiao before mm. in person face to face yeah oh, because but, but yeah. have you had, did you have a political awakening after Though, that in fact, i got a political scolding by it <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> because we like that was one of the the legacies of terence as club singapore president yeah. at our uni yeah. 
that he was pushing for this one uh, event where we invite Singaporeans to come and talk, prominent Singaporeans, and then it ends with a, a, a drama, a play put on by Singaporeans at our uni. La. Oh, that's quite uh, nice. Yeah, so one of the people we invited was uh, Mr. Francis Yao because he was already based in the US and mm. I was the chaperone actually. So when he came to Philadelphia, I met him and I met him for dinner. And he was mm. how old at that point? Eight, eight, well, yeah, I mean old. Yeah, still fucking sharp. And he was oh. asking me the names of all these politicians. And I'm like, no, I don't know. He was like, young people these days. Uh, <laughs> that's when I got the lecturing. <laughs> la. <laughs> but he was such a sweet man. And like, uh, like he was, I think the next morning also, he was so tired. So I had to go to his room to knock on his door to wake him up because he had to be at the event at like 10 a.m. So then I walked him uh, to the event. So it was, it fucking blew my mind because up to then I hear, you know, political exile, you know, he's in exile. Yeah. But he's just a, just a super cool man, super sharp, very opinionated. And like, yeah, so I got that chance. Mm. Hey, so, so were you guys nervous about inviting somebody like that? Because he's like persona non grata in Singapore, right? Yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. the we we so we invited him, but on the flip side, we also invited Chan Heng Chi. <laughs> oh, the same event. to balance, balance, balance. 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 must see how the balance. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, man, yeah, the yeah, yeah. And then, yes. and then yeah. we, we were smart. We were like, oh, we are as a committee. We invited him. In, in our committee. We have scholars from President Scholar. We have a scholar from MAS. Scholar from all this. So. It's a group. It's a group effort, lah. You know. So yeah, lah. Don't don't. And I remember Chan Hingchi spoke first, and then mm. she left. Yeah, yeah. She then she Francis. Left, yeah. So we scheduled oh, it. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, they, yeah. they they never actually came face to face. But but she knew that he was going to be there, lah. She knew, and yeah, so I, knew. I give them credit that that they. In fact, this was the first time. Like um, I think the you know the Singapore Association that's overseas for overseas Singapore. Singapore yeah, overseas OSU, Singapore unit. Yeah, OSU. they even funded part of the event. Also. Oh, yeah. Okay, so good. Yeah. I was like, wow. Uh, Okay, cool. Yeah. That, that, that they were open minded about it and they knew that we're not here to like, you know, start a political party or anything, but we just wanted to open up and, and listen to other yeah, people. Yeah. So we, we even That's invited good. we flew down Alfian Alfian side, right? From uh yeah, Alfian, Mr. Yeah. Brown, Mr. Uh, Brown the Colin Colin Go. No, Mr. Brown was the following Oh the following year. Yeah. Colin Colin yeah, the Go first was the year, first year, Colin one, Go, right? Alfian all also came down and everything. Oh nice, nice. Yeah, nice. yeah. yeah. So, so that was that was cool. Yeah, but and but yeah, we were were we scared? No lah, no. No, la, in fact, oh. but I wouldn't even say that was my political awakening because after yeah. dinner I was like, who did he talk about? What names? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so so that was the question. Like, what what do you mean by political awakening? Like, what 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 difference was I there think, in your life? I mean, I think people might define it differently, but but for me, I think it was a realization that politics matters. And mm. and you know it's 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 not enough to be apathetic, mm. and and I think you could say the same for many people in many parts of the world, right? I I, I don't think, uh, you know, Singapore has a monopoly on on political apathy. You know, I, I've seen it in different parts of the world, but but certainly you could argue there's a lot of it in Singapore. Mm. Yeah. Uh, certainly pre two thousand, there's a lot of it. Pre even pre twenty eleven, even even pre twenty fifteen, you know, maybe now now in the especially the, over the last year, you're you're seeing less of it, and you're seeing people more engaged. Um, but I I think for me that was it. The the real what's a political awakening? It's it's a realization that politics matters, that that your voice and your vote matter. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's not enough if you're living in a democracy, which we are. It's not enough to just be quiet and 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 you know. Let let the days pass and 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 be in the grind line. I I I I also that there's obviously like like so much in life. There's a there's a inequality aspect to it, Of course, right? I mean, it's a it's a luxury for some people to be able to sit back and pontificate about politics, right? Mm. Not not all of us can do that, right? Mm, there there yeah. are people who are facing the fucking grind every day, They yeah. they can't do that, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but um, anyway, for 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 those who can and can afford to, I think I think that that's what a political awakening is for me. So so it kind of happened around that time. Um, you know, reading C Francis Seale's book in the in the late nineties, and then you know, uh, it's definitely when I got involved with MPS because that then it started to, it started to occur to me with MPS that a lot of the efforts and initiatives and programs that are targeted at the people at the bottom right in my view are, are just band-aid solutions mm. right we're, we're not really doing anything in singapore to really change their life opportunities mm. for their next generation and things like that just small small band-aid solutions here and there I patching see, up see. things so that that that, that experience you know which i guess is not the 
takeaway that Vivian Balakrishnan would have liked me to have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but uh, that 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 yeah that 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 pushed me along that that way la. Then you know obviously it's I I I, I write, I've started writing a lot about Singapore politics. I've, I've kind of pushed the envelope more and more and more in terms of you know what I take on, who I criticize, what I criticize. I, you know I think it's just a slow process of of. Uh, building an audience and and building my own confidence and things like that, but 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 yeah, it's it's not. I, I wouldn't say it's my and and I kind of tell buddies this every other day, but you know because they they ask me about it. But it, I wouldn't say it's my preferred uh, mode or genre or anything like that. Mm. Like it's not like I, I I love political writing. I, I I do it because I think there's a gap here and there's a need here. But mm. you know I, I I I'm I'm writing a book on China and India now where I I. I I spent eight months traveling from South India to Beijing mm. in 2013 and 2014, and I've been back a few times. And you know, I'm, I'm writing a story about about the cultures, about spirituality, about women's rights. I mean, that that, that that's the that's the kind of writing I, I really love to do. Mm. Mm. So, am I right to say that? I mean, it sounds like that's all writing is basically almost like human human behavior. That kind of like those kind of like uh, things that when masses of people gather. How they behave and these this these interactions that pop up is that kind of like like your yeah, yeah your, I guess. your gravy your jam yeah yeah I guess I guess that's uh you know so, so a, but yeah. then wouldn't uh, being outside of Singapore place you in a better position to to write about these issues and all because I mean in Singapore it, it's yeah the grind and cost of living and everything. I mean, for example, a few podcasts yes. ago, we had Anthony Chen, you know, the filmmaker, mm. and he said being based in London actually yep. helps him view Singapore a little more objectively, almost yeah. like from a high level, yeah. you know. Um, and like, have you, have you, like, yeah, exactly like what Terence was saying. Like, how do you weigh doing this in Singapore versus doing it outside? I, I mean, I think firstly, it's true that it, it, it's important to have perspective inside and outside of a place for mm, sure mm, right mm, and mm. and you know because you you get you get you get sometimes too lost uh, you know there's when you're in singapore there's sometimes a bit too much navel gazing and you get too much too lost in in very minute issues so it's good to have perspective from outside yeah. whether it's from yourself or from somebody else i i, I think what's what's also happened alongside i, I mean short answer to your question is yes yeah. I, I think there are many other parts of the world where um, it's it's more interesting for a writer to live, mm. um, and and forget affordability. I mean, affordability is very important, but but even putting aside affordability, you know, I think um, the amount of material you have, uh, the 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 community that you have, mm. you know, in in many other parts of the world, including the places I lived in the states, you know, yeah. you have a community of writers much more easily accessible, um, and 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 I. So the, there's just uh, a situation, I guess, in Singapore where there aren't that many people. There aren't that many people who are very encouraging of of the arts in general and and certainly of writing. Mm. So, but I think what what happened uh, alongside my 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 growth, right, I, I, or, or my my career, is that um, I, I've also started to realize that it's important to just. Um, be a part of the artistic scene in Singapore. Mm. So yes, you know, yes, I think in some ways there could be more material and more uh, of a of a wider career trajectory for me in other parts of the world. But 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 you know, I I, I think I'm I'm getting a lot of fulfillment mm. by you know uh, quote unquote mentoring and 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 being here and and being a part of the scene here. Mm. And being a voice here, which I w which I wouldn't do if I was outside. You know, I I think the people who are outside, with all due respect to them, you know, it's it's difficult to necessarily be very engaged in what's happening in Singapore, and it's the same for any country. Um, mm. If you're outside of that country, mm. but but do you feel like being in Singapore, there are things that you can't say that maybe you can say outside? Because I think it was a few weeks ago that Mr. Bilahari, I think he shared something kind of chastising you about writing about Singapore in a way that is very critical. It was him, right? Or or someone else? Or do you not pay attention to social media at all? No, wait. Are, are you talking about LinkedIn? No. No. I, I, I think there I saw was, it on There Facebook. was somebody on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So, regardless of whether it's uh, who... Like, I can imagine you getting a lot of pushback lah, for your articles. Yeah. Right. So, do you ever feel like, oh, fuck, there's something I really want to write, but I cannot. Uh, or do you just fucking you just 
you stick by what you want to say and let the the backlash come la. <laughs> uh no i i i i think my my view on self censorship and and how i self censor you know i i think it's one of the most important things for any artist you know i i don't think everybody thinks about it enough mm. but we all self censor to some degree mm. and in some ways it's good when we self censor because you know you, you have to be responsible in your yep, communication yep. So you don't want to just say anything at all out there, mm. um, and I think over the past sixteen years, while I've while I've slowly developed as a writer in Singapore, I I've started to self censor less and less. So I, I'll I'll give you some very clear examples, right? So mm -hmm. so uh, when I first joined the Economist Group in '06, the Economist had recently been sued by. The Lee family, mm. okay. Yeah. So in two thousand and four, they were sued by the Lee family, um, and I remember the exact phrase because they were talking about Ho Ching and Tamasek, mm. mm. and the and and the phrase they used was a whiff of nepotism, and 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 this phrase is like you know it's it's like whispered in the corridors and the economists <laughs> when I got there you know people remember this phrase that that made them run foul of the of the Lee family and the Singapore government. Mm. So in 04, they and then they, they, they had to issue an apology. I, I, I think they paid a fine and all and all yeah. the rest of it. And I think, if I'm not wrong, that was the last time the the uh, anybody in Singapore sued the economists mm. was in 04. Mm. And, and, you know, people I spoke to after that, um, some in the company, some outside, they, I, I think, you know, that there was a bit of humility about that whole episode because... You know, I think they they at least some people agree that they shouldn't have used that phrase, mm. right? Because it's it's uh, it it opens yourself up to a to a libel suit, and it, and it's mm. not something that you can actually conclusively prove, lah. You, yeah. I mean, you can't prove nepotism, and you probably can't even prove a whiff of nepotism. So yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. shouldn't even mention it, lah, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the, the point I'm making is, so when when I joined them in '06, suddenly at that point in my career. I would have been really damn scared to say anything about the Lee family, lah. Mm. Mm. Right? If, if you told me write about the Lee family, I, no, no way. You know, I, I'll write about PAP policies. Yeah. Right. Mm. I'll talk about you know income inequality and things like that. Yeah. But you don't ask me to write about the Lee family, lah. No, no way. And I think that's that's one very clear issue where today I feel very differently. And 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 there are a whole bunch of things obviously that have happened. Outside of me, you know, obviously my own confidence has grown in in, mm. my, in my ability to articulate myself and say something while while staying clear of of defamation and all the rest of it. Mm. So that confidence has grown, but but I think there are a lot of external things that have happened as well. Um, you know, including uh, Lee Sian Lung's siblings uh, coming out against him and accusing him of corruption and mm. uh, you know allegations he denied. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I'll give you, you know, uh, six years ago, I would I would never have come on a show I, I, like this and said and, and said Lee Sian Lung is is corrupt, right? And 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 today I wouldn't do that as well. But today, you know what I can do? I can say Lee Sian Lung is corrupt, comma according to his siblings. And actually, that that's simply a factual statement mm. that I just made. Mm. Right? Mm. Don't don't worry. Nobody's gonna yeah. sue you guys because yeah. I just I just made a factual. No, yeah, no, we, just, uh, we just edited our. <laughs> <editor>. <laughs> <laughs> We don't edit anything yeah, on this podcast except when the except when Lee so, family is mentioned. <laughs> but 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 I'll just I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just extend it a bit. So Lee Sian Lung is corrupt, comma according to his siblings. But I think you know you should show respect to anybody you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in order for me to show sufficient respect for for Lee Sian Lung's position, I I need to add in parenthesis charges he's denied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. right yep. that, that that's what a good responsible writer or commentator should do because that that you know. Sibling said he's corrupt. He's you know abuse of power and all the rest of it, and and he denied yeah. those allegations. So you know that, that's what that's what you have to say. So, so, so I mean th these are the sorts of things that I think in in today's Singapore, you know, there are in interesting and important ways to talk about it. You know, mm. you know when 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 I talk about Lee Sian Lung's siblings uh, alleging that he abused state power, mm. right? Yeah, I'm, it's not it's not something you you just do off the cuff or you know, but but I think it's it's an important part of the discourse for the country because mm. it's a big deal, lah. Yeah. Lee Kuan Yew had three kids. Yeah, two of them have said that the other one has abused state power. Yeah, he's yeah. denied the allegations. Fine, finish. That's it. But yeah. you know, you, it's you, a fact, like, we can't we can't yeah. hide it from public discourse. It's out there, right? Yeah. Um. Anyway, the, 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 I I would never have dared say anything like that. Even if it, if it it had been around, I guess fifteen years ago. But but so that means in some way, what you're saying is you 
you kind of like have gotten, I mean, in some way aware that, like, like what you said, that one statement with the thing about discipline is a, is a fact, right? Um, and, and that's something that you are a lot more aware of uh, and kind of prevents you from getting implicated in any anything ne- negative, la, any defamation or anything, la, right? In some way. Like just understanding the nuances and how yes. it kind of frees you from... Own self, own self train, own self to... Own to, self train, own self train. Own self I mean, it's, it's not own self train. I mean, I, I'm... Well, Vivian B would be proud, for, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like fortunate everything. to have other people who have very very <laughs> kindly mentored me throughout my life. So, so yeah. Um, I... I, I mean, I think part of it is 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 my own uh, knowledge and confidence, mm, but mm, but mm. I think part of it is also just Singapore is changing, and and you know I think um, I I remember the first time I I wrote something that was critical of the PAP as opposed to PAP policies, right? Mm. Yeah, so yeah, critical yeah. of the of of the party. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, I think it was I, I published something in the Online Citizen in in. 2011, I think, yeah. mm. and and yeah, you know, it, you, you it's it's almost like you know testing the waters kind of thing, like, You know, see see what my friends say, see what other people say. You know, I think I, I think society has changed as well, right? I mean, yeah. today today me saying something critical about about Lee Kuan Yew, even you know, um, mm. in 2015, you know, when Amos Yee said all those things about Lee Kuan Yew, you know, I I, I think it was very raw he, he had just passed away you know I, I think today now saying things about Lee Kuan Yew it's it's, it's again it's it's pe- people are a bit more open-minded in terms of of assessing his legacy mm. than they were five years ago than they than they were 15 years ago 15 years ago I wouldn't have dared say much about Lee Kuan Yew I mean you know you you, you say little bits here and there oh were they really Marxists were they, you know you, yeah, but, yeah. but you don't really have a full critique of of him, right? But I think our society is evolving and maturing. People are, are increasingly able to handle those conversations, uh, which is which is important and which is great. So, so are you saying that that generally you are filled with optimism in terms of how the discussions are going in Singapore, or like for me, honestly, sometimes I look at the internet in Singapore. I'm like, is this progress? It feels like we're just even more polarized, lah. You know, now everybody has a voice. Everybody can get people around them, regardless of what they say. Uh, and so that's me being the the cynic la, or the pessimist. But you, like, where would you say you are in terms of that sort of stuff? I I I, I think your cynicism is well founded la. And and there are some days I wake up and I and I feel the exact same way. You know, mm. so I think your cynicism is well founded. Not necessarily issues to do with Singapore per se. You know, mm. these are much broader, grander issues having to do with the nature of social media discourse. The nature of technology uh, market concentration, you know how how the Facebooks and Twitters of the world can can mediate conversation. You know, I I, I think the 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 uniquely Singapore aspects of this problem that that you just mentioned are, are, are smaller. You know, mm. they're much grander yeah, forces at play. Yeah, and 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 those grander forces they they worry me a lot. Um, you know, I, I I don't agree with with the with the PAPs solution to uh these problems i mean pofma is just one of their you know the the main the main solu- you know a- answer that they have to to these problems i i don't agree with it i you know for a whole bunch of reasons um but neither neither do i necessarily think that we're in terrible shape when i look across the world mm. Mm, right mm, so I, I i saw a stat recently that that you know 13 only 13 percent of the world's population lives somewhere with a truly free press Mm. So you know, I, I I think in this in this you know every society has to navigate you know between total total freedom of speech, which is in in my view not ideal, mm. right? Because there have to be curbs on certain things, yeah. mm. uh, and I and I don't mean just curbs on things like um, the obvious things like incitement to hatred and and you know racist speech, hate speech, which which are the mm. usual exceptions, mm. But I also mean. Increasingly, because of what you said, you know, it's it's very polarized. You know, different people have different um, forms of power and access in how they can project their voice. So I think it's very important to make sure that that we have a society, especially for a multicultural, diverse society, we have a society where all the groups have equal access to to having their voices heard. Mm. You know, so it's mm. not so much free speech. It's mm. more it's more just allowing different groups to to have their voices heard, which is which is a difficult thing to do. Um, and I think we need to get there. 
Am I am I optimistic? I I I think I I am like when I, when I look at the broad broad sweep of things, I am optimistic for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, I I, I think like if you look at the discourse around the election last year, mm. if you look at if you look at the way just just some something very very small and, and tangible, if you look at the way uh, uh, we all lampooned uh, Heng Sui Kiat's East Coast plan, East Coast plan mm. right? Yeah. I I was thinking when I saw that, I was like. I don't think I've ever seen like you know some atas el- elite figure right get yeah. hantam like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've never in my life and all that right. <laughs> like immediately, I mean yeah, the, the yeah. Nando's was in all kinds of people, yeah. and 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 that that was just like a like a like a flowering of like of like opinion and 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 discourse right. It was great. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of things that that give me hope for Singapore mm. um, in terms of our discourse and democracy for sure. Mm. So I mean, um, because you had your political awakening and you realize it's it's for everyone, uh, really politics. Then why why not? Have you ever been thought about the the eventuality or the possibility of going into politics? Oh, dun, dun, wow! Dun. You dropped the this, question this, this yeah. early. Uh, what time is it, man? <laughs> yeah. I haven't had my first, I haven't had my first beer of the day, man. <laughs> what hour in? What hour is? Really, Everything really, has been really, building really. up to this question. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't ask it in the. I don't ask it in the the very cynical way, like, hey, huh. why do you just put your money where your mouth is? But, yeah, because yeah. I also agree with you, like, when we study overseas, I think mm. the, a lot of people don't realise the realisation, a lot of people realise that Singapore, you know, certain things are not as bad as even in compared to mm, the US yeah. and all. Uh. Mm. And uh, you gain an appreciation for certain things and definitely as you get older, you know, you think about how do I contribute to my community and everything. Uh. And, um, I mean, I see a lot of people on my Facebook, you know, they go, they go to MPS sessions, uh, but when I see it, sometimes I feel like, mm, you know, it, it comes from a place where it's about networking. It's for the or, grammar. Or, oh. you know, it's, yeah, it's always <laughs> about like, or talking about where you are in your career and how you are helping people. And, you know, there, there seems to be more. There are a uh, lot of social climbers social in our country, climbers. man. So, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Chalat, man. so I don't anyhow go to this person. <laughs> hey, you all should go and do politics because I, I know, you, you want one look, you know what's the intention already. Whereas what I'm hearing from you is much more of a, you know, everyone needs to have a say in your country and all that, lah, right? So, but but the thing is that we've, you know, it's hard to find examples of people who really, you know, go all the way and they say, hey, you know, I'm going to run for politics and do it myself and show it can be done. Lah. So, so that's why I mean, I'm, I'm asking this question. It's not something that we just ask just because someone say, I'm yeah, interested. Yeah, yeah. If you want to announce your entry into politics, also now will be the <laughs> best <laughs> time. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Am I allowed to look in the camera by the way? Of course, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I can talk to people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> 2025. <laughs> 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 like Kanye West. Uh, no, no, no. So, okay, okay. So, uh, you know, I think it, 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 it's a question that keeps popping up for me. Lah, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, not just others asking, but internally every now and then I'll ask yeah. myself. Lah, also, mm-hmm. right? You know, I think it's, it's, it's good to have that conversation every now and then. And and certainly that 03, 05 period when mm. when I when I uh, was volunteering MPS, yep. I, I I think I certainly thought quite strongly about it then, mm. you know. That, so so maybe I was one of those people also network. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> Go back see your oh no no Facebook <laughs> there no, no social media no, no social, social media, media. Yeah, yeah. 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 lucky lucky lucky, lucky. Yeah. friendster uh, friendster is it <laughs> friendster <laughs> friendster yeah, yeah good old friendster um. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess my main thought today, my main thought today on this is that I actually see, you know, enough decent politicians mm. um, in the certainly in the opposition, uh, in 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 the PAP as well. I'm, I'm talking about the the younger, you know, I'm talking about the 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 the, the streams coming in, right? The, the much younger mm-hmm. people coming in. Um, I, I I see a lot of decent good people. I mean, of course, you know, politics being politics, there'll always be self interested social yeah. climbers who are yeah. getting into politics, lah. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I, I see enough decent talent coming in, and 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 w- what's also happened is that I see a real need to build up the media in Singapore, help build up mm-hmm. media in Singapore. So I, I think and 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 the comparison that that I've I've, I've used sometimes in conversation, uh, it's not it's not my I you know this idea didn't come from me but but is uh, the MP Lewis Ng right? Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. So and and I've had I've talked about Lewis's career with different people and my my view is that he made a big mistake going to politics, mm. right? Because 
he should have stayed in civil society and helped build civil society. Yeah. Oh, actually, for, for context, for those who, who oh. don't know, Louis Ng, I know he was very involved in animal welfare societies. Like, like everyone, uh, dog people, uh, we all know, knew about him and everything, even before he became politician. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so he was head of a group called Acres, I think. Yeah, right? yeah Acres, Animal, mm-hmm. something, like, yeah, mm-hmm. Care and Rescue and everything. Uh, and I think even today, he still, you know, uses his platform to do a lot of things for, for animal welfare and all. Uh. Mm. So, so, but you're, you're saying that you think that his entry from civic society to politics was a uh, wrong move. Uh. Wrong, I mean, it, it's probably a, a good move for the PAP, mm. but, but wrong move, I think, for our democracy as a whole. Because uh, a democracy as a whole, a country as a whole, you know, you, you, you need to build up all the different pillars of that country. And politics is just one of them. The mm. political union is just one of them. Um, you know, our, our civil society has traditionally been quite weak. Mm. You know, of course, you've you've got organizations like Aware now that yep. that have grown a lot, but but traditionally we've been quite weak, lah. We yeah. we've been a politically centered, heavy kind of country. You know, all the decision making flows through the great politicians, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, but I think what we need to start doing, and and it's happening, it's happening in a slow way, but it's happening. Is is you know, when you build up civil society. We need to build up uh, the media for sure. You know, the the, the media, in, in in my view, is just so immature compared to, you know, medias in, in most thriving democracies. Mm. You know, mm. you, 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 you compare with the top media in places like London, New York. Mm. You know, our, our, our Singapore media is so far behind, in, mm. in my opinion. But mm. Can you clarify what you mean by uh, Im- immature or like just just for someone who sure. maybe doesn't watch so much CNN or anything. Or, yeah. So I I I think I mean there 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 are, there are two problems and maybe they're related. One is that there's not much media diversity. So you know you've got the mainstream media channels, which I think are perhaps um, you know on the political spectrum, you you'd probably say they are center right or maybe a bit more to the right mm. in terms of their views. Mm. Now, if you look at the alternative media, you've, you know, let me just take uh, Mothership Rice and um, Online Citizen. So, so you argue, you know, TOC somewhere on the left, you know, may, maybe Mothership and, and, and Rice are a bit closer to the middle. Mm. But you don't really have a diversity of media for a diverse society, right? It, it, it's not like these different media channels are offering you different perspectives on climate change or, or different perspectives on, you know, how to tackle the, the free speech censorship issue. You know, mm. we, we don't have for, for or, you know, what's in the news now, the transgender issue that came up, you know, I, I mean, a, a proper thinking society, when, when an issue arises, the media would immediately have two, three, four different opinions falling on different parts of the political spectrum, mm. you know, and, and this is what happens in mature societies, right? Yeah. Uh, whether or not you like Fox, uh, whether or not you like uh, Breitbart, CNBC, all, all the rest of them, you, you do have the availability of different views yeah. Yeah. To, 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 to portray a particular issue. And, and we don't have that in Singapore. And, and, and I think it's, it's the responsibility of those of us who you know, are, are, are perhaps positioned to do so to, to, help, to help push our media along in that direction. So I... Mm. I, I almost see it as a you know that that that's maybe maybe it's my ego talking but but I, I see that, that that that's sort of part of my my responsibility and 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 what I what I would like to do so so why wouldn't I I, I enter politics I think it's because then I'm just feeding the idea that you know, which which I think Lewis Ng has unfortunately done I'm just feeding the idea that that you know all power flows through politicians which mm. it's not you know we 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 need to appreciate and help push power centers around society that that's what's going to help singapore grow mm. Mm. so so that's why i mean uh, that it's it's interesting that you bring up that distribution of power because you know just now when you're saying we need to build up other pillars of civil society and all right because i mean I'm sure you get a ton of pushback or you have gotten a ton of pushback from family and friends who say, why you complain? Look at Singapore. You know, just <laughs> yesterday, today, we were, what, voted the best place to be in the world during the pandemic. Yes. Right? So It's great. I, I was happy to see that. Yeah. like yeah. I mean, like, especially given what you're seeing in around the world. Uh, and then even... I don't give the politicians much credit for that, but carry on. Oh, I give the people the, the people. credit. <laughs> the people. <laughs> carry on, no, carry on. Sorry. Because, because the thing is, like, on one hand, you know, like, uh, when you look at the countries that are more democratic democracies, right, where things like everyone argues about everything, 
and every decision is so fucking long. And then you look at like how Singapore, okay, I'll, I'll, admittedly not the most conversational, everything that like you mm. do, but the output is is not bad. Lah, right? So do you ever feel that, that conflict or or do you get sick and tired of people asking you this because like, your worldview is different or how you grapple with that? Because personally, mm. I also feel sometimes like, fuck, you know, we're doing this media thing. Yeah, we see in the papers we are non-essential and all this fucking <laughs> shit. Mm. Then we're like, what the fuck are we doing this? Yeah. And then when the pandemic, you just look around the world, you look, everything's going to shit. And Singapore, yeah, I mean like, it, it feels like, okay, everyone wears masks, but generally we are kind of back to some semblance of society. So then why make the effort, lah, you know? Why not just just enjoy this? You compromise certain freedoms for safety, for you know, mm. like no COVID, you know, no lockdown. How you grapple with all that? Uh? So okay, so on COVID, um, I, I I actually really meant what I said just now. I mm. I think the reason Singapore is in a good position has very little to do with politicians. Mm. You know, I I I think. It has to do with politicians in insofar as you could say, oh, you know, Lee Kuan Yew and the first generation created mm. these wonderful institutions that are still in play today. Yeah. Fine, yeah. I get that. It's nothing to do with today's crop of politicians. In, in, in fact, I, I might almost argue that they they worsen things in different ways. You know, uh, Josephine Thio and the dormitories and 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 them wanting to have the early election. I'm I'm, I'm not sure all those things necessarily helped our COVID response. But the reason Singapore is doing well and I, I, whenever I'm on calls with my friends overseas, I always say, yeah, you know, I'm so happy to be living in Singapore because, you know, actually you're right. It's, yeah. it's comfortable. I feel safe. Yeah. Um, I've got tons of relatives in India. Everything that's been happening in India over yeah. the past, you know, week it's has, crazy, been, has yeah. been tragic mm. and you, you feel very lucky to be here but um, I don't think it has to do with politics and, and, and I think neither, neither do I think is it necessarily related to the marketplace of ideas or or the messiness of democracy, right? Mm. Because and 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 the best counter example would be places like Taiwan and Korea. Mm. You know, so so I so I know I, I know early on in the in, in the COVID story, right? Um so we if we go back to early 2020, you know, January, February, there were people in Singapore making fun of Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong yeah, was yeah. was was yeah. going to shit. And you know, and, and, and before you realize which countries would were actually doing well there was this, you know, I, you know, this sort of the 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 closet autocrats were all ready to pop the champagne, right? They, yeah, uh, yeah, they, yeah. This proves vindicates the 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 value of an autocracy where you don't have, mm -hmm. you know, multiple centers of power and the messiness of democracy. Look at America, you know, people are not wearing masks. Da, 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 da. But I think once South Korea and Taiwan, which are two of the messiest fucking democracies in the world you know you have fist fights in parliament and everything <laughs> messy but entertaining right. messy, very, but, very yeah. entertaining yeah. very entertaining yeah. um, um, once once those two became also known as sort of you know these these these, these shining you know bright spots in the in the battle against covid right yeah. then i think that that argument you know very quickly went out the window it, it's it's not necessarily uh, an issue with the messiness of democracy or the marketplace of ideas and and the other point I'd like to make on that is, is that I think too often in Singapore, and I think this is a symptom of our of our early growth and development, right? Where mm. we always have this like, we need to be scared about somebody else eating mm. our lunch, you know, the, this vulnerability ethos that we're, yep. we're small, we're insecure, vulnerable, and, and you know, the, the, this dry. And, and, and in a way, the good thing is that you could argue feeds our dynamism and our hunger, right? Fine. But I think the the negative part of that is is always comparing down and 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 why do we always want to compare down and worry about the the worst case kind of tail scenario why why don't why don't we compare up and and think about how much better we might be you know how, how you know how, how much more vibrant our society might be if we if we manage to get speech right if we manage to get democracy right you know i'm i'm it's 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 not it's not clear that other countries are th th there's a perfect model for us anywhere mm. out there in the world, mm. right? So, yeah. so I agree. But, but, but why don't we 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 think optimistically? Maybe we'll do better. Mm. Why why are we always you know there's a constant Singapore thing. We're always worrying about that. We you know we might slide down some slippery slope. Yeah, yeah slide, slippery slope. exactly. <laughs> whether whether it's towards a welfare state or whether it's towards a messy democracy. But I I think we need more thinking that would say actually you know. We, we've got a situation now where we've got a lot of things right mm. thanks to our founding fathers and mothers or whoever they were and why don't we think of how much better we can be mm. I, there's not enough of that thinking going on that, that, that's mm. my that's my fear mm. 
But that's interesting because even a few episodes ago, we spoke about the closing of the substation. Mm. You know, because if you look at it from a yeah economic, tangible uh, perspective, yeah, it makes sense, you know, to rent out that space to more, you know, so you have more returns and all that. But what we were debating is that is there a qualitative thing that is worth, how you say, uh, uh, maintaining because it is a symbol or something that maybe is a bit more qualitative. Lah. You know, that, that it serves a purpose in terms of uh, like just furthering arts in a in a maybe not so economic way, but more yeah. than just that, lah. Yeah, just just the, its presence just shows that we are more welcoming to like experimentation and everything, lah. Yeah. And how much is that worth in society? You know, to to tell young people that you know there's a space for you if you want to experiment and show something that's not so mainstream. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, that's what we felt like was lacking in say the NAC's response. Like, oh, you know, they were not doing well as a business and and you know their part of their revenue came from timber selling alcohol and stuff like so, that. So given your background and interest in economics, I know that many a time there'll be some economist who tries to map some sort of human behavior to some model, some mm. mathematical thing. Have you ever come across anything that tries to quantify the value of art, for example, or creative work? So that next time when someone tells me I can just send them this link and I don't need to do anything else. <laughs> I'm 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 sure there is. I'm I'm not very familiar with uh, where the literature and conversation is on that. Mm. No, I'm sure mm. there is. Mm. I'm sure there is, but I just don't know where it's at now. But do you get a lot of people also kind of like? Does that come up in conversation when you try and argue for like what you say like the other pillars of society? Because I mean, maybe it's because growing up in Singapore, you think, eh, hey, what else is there in society? Mm. The marketplace of ideas, really, is it that important? You know, so, I, and I still feel it also, like, I think the younger generation is changing, but it still feels like what, like, I'm more with you on that in that sense. I think that Singapore has a lot of potential. There's a lot of talent in, in every way. But, like, the openness to ideas or even the awareness, that, okay, maybe that can be a good thing. I still find uh, a lot of resistance, like, even within me. So then, like, like, like... Because we can't quantify it, is it? Or I mean, that's or what that's what I feel like. Sometimes... The argument against it feels like okay. Has, if there's some way to quantify it, it will make kind of rebutting this economic ROI on the arts a little easier to, to how you say rebut la. Yeah, I I I mean I don't have an easy answer to that except mm. I mean suddenly, we're we're a society that that places a lot of premium on 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 the bottom line and on numbers and mm. you know the the data Nazis. Run yeah. wild, right? So we are a datacracy in, in in many ways, and 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 the problem, you know, I think in some ways it's fine if we're a datacracy, but the the big problem, of course, is that the establishment hogs all the data, mm-hmm. right? So there's there's often this 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 dialectic where it's like, oh, you know, if uh, you don't like what we're doing, why don't you propose a better solution, lah? Then you you're like. Yeah, but we don't even have we, we don't even have the data. Share the data first, then we can propose a better yeah. solution. Uh, yeah, otherwise, so you know, the establishment keeps calling people out for mm. not coming up with better ideas, but then keeping all the cards close to its chest, right? So it's it's impossible to actually come up with new ideas unless you have access to the data, and 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 it's true in in many different fields. Um, I I I'm, I haven't looked closely enough at 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 arts, mm. at the numbers in arts, and 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 at the substation um, to to talk very closely on that mm. but um yeah just in general as a society i mean there there are a lot of things that that you know we need to value that that may not be so easily quantifiable mm, mm, mm. you know mm. uh yeah so i mean yeah. uh just broadly speaking you look at the next generation of singaporeans i think you said that you were very uh, heartened by the response during the election and everything, people making memes and all that. Lah. But let's say there's a younger version of you coming up from Raffles Junior College. Like a young year, Sudir. Or, yeah, young Sudir. <laughs> oh, God. What would you tell <laughs> him help to us. do with his life? Like now, lah, in, you know, in, in light of everything in the environment we're in. Management consulting, uh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Startup, startup. Lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. Face accountant. Lawyer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Managed to stop pre-COVID. Oh my god! Can, can we talk about the pre-COVID world or what? Or you you no, the, no, I mean, the, like, the current world, yeah, right? Yeah. No, the world is as it is. That's a question. The world I, is as it is. That's a question I ask myself a lot because I have a kid now, a young kid. Mm. Do I really want him to pursue the arts or you know pursue your passion in Singapore and all? You know, that's, that's something I ask myself, lah. Well, oh, so so if somebody was in high school, yeah, you know, I I I I would actually tell them to go wherever they want in the world uh, that's best for whatever their interest is at that uh, at that moment. Why not? But and you, and and but not to come back to Singapore to help build up the you know the other pillars that we're talking about. Somebody who's 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 like in high school or university. I thought you, you is said it? secondary school in Singapore. Oh, what do you say? Oh, I mean, no, no, I mean, yeah, like, like, like you are at a crossroads in your life. You are finishing education or coming out of army or something, and you wanna, yeah, like, just contribute. You you wanna be, you know, uh, contributing member contributing of society, member yeah. of society, and everything. Yeah. I mean, it, if you're asking in terms of discipline, I would say I think liberal arts is 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 a good way to go, mm. right? If you're asking in terms of country, and, and the reason liberal arts is a good way to go, I, I think it's, it's increasingly important for people to be multidisciplinarians. Mm. You know, I, I, I think um, given the way society is evolving and technology is changing things, you know, I think that that's, that's going to be, a, you know, somewhere in, in the liberal arts spectrum would be, you know, you, 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 you'd, you'd learn things that would be useful. Um, as as opposed, I say that as opposed to specializing, you know, going and doing law or going and doing medicine or whatever. Yeah. So, so if, if the question was about discipline, that that would be my answer. But if the question was about country, you know, I, I, I would say go and go with to it whichever country where you could, you know, um, become an expert in something you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, I I think the good thing today is that. As opposed to late '90s when I was going to university, yeah, is that there are so many more interesting countries that are now considered "quote unquote" feasible destinations, lah, mm. right? Mm. Including mm. many parts of China and India that mm. people would have never gone in the '90s. I mean, yep. you tell people to go and study in Shanghai in the '90s, they'll say, "Forget it, lah," right? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, true. Um, there, there are many parts of Africa, you know, South Africa, East Africa. Uh, North Africa, uh, many different countries where I think it's 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 possible to to go and do something. You know, I, mm. I I I have friends who are entrepreneurs who are who are doing things in places like Tanzania. You know, which, which again, growing up, I I hardly heard of Singaporeans going and working in in like remote parts of Africa. I don't yeah. not that Tanzania is that remote, but so I think in a way we've got a much wider canvas to play with yeah. across the world mm. yeah. you know when 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 i was growing up if you want to go overseas what what uh, australia uk america you know yeah. I, I, the world has changed so I, I i would i would tell the younger person sorry i, I don't want to call it younger me but the younger yeah, person younger like, like, mm. <laughs> i would tell the younger person to to just think very broadly about the world and 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 um and about what they want to do because the, in in many ways I feel you know that that there's a much uh, wider canvas for them to play with. Mm. Mm. Would would your would what you say be different if it was a younger you? Okay, let's say re rewind to like two thousand nine when you were deciding Burning Man or MPS, <laughs> MPS or Burning Man. What what would you say your to yourself after uh, now fifteen years from then? Uh, after what you have seen, what you have gone through. Um, Should have stayed at Burning Man. <laughs> sure, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. My first Burning Man was in 02, la, 02 ah, 03. Yeah. So that, I don't know, may, hard to, yeah, it's hard to, I mean, I'm I'm sure there are a lot of things I would tell myself to, to do better in life, but, but uh, whether I would choose a different path, I mean, that that's a... Or maybe choose this path sooner or a anything that if you could... For like uh, a minute, go back and face young Sudhir. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean the 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 thing I always wonder about regretting is not having kids, lah. That would mm. be the one thing, right? Mm. That oh, would be that's the interesting. One yeah, sorry, I, I know that's probably not what you asked. So you're you planning to have kids when you were 15, is it? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you're like, oh <laughs> shit, not, sec four. Not that I regret it now, la, but, I'm just, but it's something I, w- I wonder whether I'll regret. <laughs> um, yeah, I maybe maybe I would have told myself actually to do what you guys have done, right? Uh, to, mm. to, to get involved in video much earlier. I, I, mm. I wish I got involved with, with mm. video in, at, at an earlier age. Mm. Um, I think I was, you know, still a bit skeptical. Mm. I was a bit skeptical about where video was going. I see. Uh, so maybe that that's certainly one thing I would have done. Um, other mediums, you know, uh, perhaps... Uh, radio podcasting, you know, perhaps I, I I should have spent more time on that at a younger age. I didn't. Um, um, in terms of writing, I think, yeah, it's maybe maybe uh, yeah. Actually, I know I I I would have um, I would have pushed myself more in terms of fiction. Mm. So I I was a late comer to the fiction game. Yeah. Okay. So I I, I read fiction when I was very young, literature and all that all that jazz in school. Mm. Uh, once I started doing econs and and you know a bit of political science and all that, I I I just became like a hardcore nonfiction person lah. Mm. Mm. You know, I I I didn't actually, which I think was a was a big mistake um, in terms of my thinking, literally de- literary development and thinking. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I shut out fiction and and I've gotten back into it in the last five years. So I I read a lot more fiction today. Mm. Mm. Uh, the other thing, sorry, now I mean, yeah, I can think of more, much more things now, but they, they they all have to do with 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 um with media, you know. Mm. So I, I I think I should have spent a lot more time, uh, watching cartoons actually. Mm. So watching watching the likes of Simpsons, South Park, things like that. Mm. And what? Why so? Why cartoons specifically? Um, because again, I I, I think every time I I move to a new medium, it 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 changes the way I think about my own medium in, in ways I didn't expect. It, mm. It's hard to really articulate. But, mm. but you know, um, yeah, I, 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 so, so why cartoons specifically? I, I, I think um, both as a, as a cultural force. So, you know, the, the, the impact it had on people who were, who were watching The Simpsons mm. or following The Simpsons. Mm. But, but also in terms of the, the, the conversational speed and tenor and tone and things like that, which is very different you know, from from regular TV. Mm. I see, I see. So I think there are aspects of and 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 I mean animation in general. Mm. I I I I would love to maybe do something more in animation at some point in time. Mm. Mm. I so I feel, you know, from from yeah, JC so high school all the way to my late twenties. Yeah, I had a very narrow media diet. Mm. Mm. So I think that's a better answer to your question. I, I would mm. tell the younger me to di- have diversified my media diet yeah. at a younger age. I mean, I mean, I'm glad I've started doing it now. Yeah. Mm. But I, I think it would have been better if I had done that earlier. So that means now you're just lapping up like TikTok and Clubhouse, yeah. right, is it? <laughs> TikTok like, all the way, man. TikTok, bro. <laughs> and, 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 and my best friend now works at ByteDown, so he keeps sending me, you know, he, our future. conversations are almost half on, you know, TikTok stuff. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> Okay, so we, we actually have a few listener questions. Yes, yes. Um, oh. yeah, yeah, so so we just opened up to our wonderful subreddit. No, but Instagram. before that, I just wanted to also say, I think, I think, no, I think, I think what you're, you know, uh, I can see that you are, you were really thinking hard about the answer. La. But it's something I, I do, I do think about also. La. Like, you, you say that we started mm. early, but we actually were very late to the game also. And somehow, you know, earlier in my life, I also knew, I was also always, always flirting with this, with media and everything. Mm. And I kind of knew like, okay, this is something I'm really, really interested in. How early on? Uh? Uh, even in, in primary school all that already, I was like that guy, with, oh, you have video camera. Oh, we filmed this oh. for our project. Oh yeah, then I'm writing it and then filming it and then putting it together. So I, I was always interested, but just like, just wanted to follow that path, uh, you know, and then, yeah, yeah. Like, like yeah. you just feel like you can't step away from it. You know, it's, I was, yeah, so, it's so yeah. I mean, you know, I like, like people sometimes tell me now, now, you know, now I'm 40, and, and people started telling me, oh, you know, you're very daring, very brave. You 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 went the independent route. You do this, you do that. But actually, in my mind, no. I for many years I, I chose the safe route. You know, yeah. I mean, working at for seven years at the, at the Economist Group, that that's a safe option, lah. I mean, it's it's a big brand name institution. And, you know, like like the people in Singapore, who you know, I think are really adventurous, really daring, are, are the people 
straight out of school they they go yeah. and do something funky mm, la, like right, like right, so right. in 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 the writing world a good example would be Kirsten Han right mm. like like Kirsten from a very young age was already you know on her own freelancing and contributing yeah. i mean i mine compared to Kirsten was a very comfortable existence right i, I had a nice paying job at the economist yeah. and when i left the economist i had, the economist on my cv it was very easy for me to get work mm. you know so i i um I might have told myself to be a bit more daring la, mm. and, 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 and start out earlier. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to... Mm. But on the flip side, I think like I was never that person young ever thinking I would enter media. Because, you know, you said you were, you saw like the people making film and you said you like to write. Like I never knew. And I think in some ways, starting later is quite good also. Mm. Just, just the fact that I had worked a few years, I had some savings, made it easier to not just do what everyone else was doing and be a bit more open to risk la. at least in the in the short term when we were doing this for when we started la. Wh- what were you doing before i was at singapore airlines bro scholar oh, yeah. la. scholar uh, no, pilot I, no no no, no. i'm scholar colorblind. i couldn't be a pilot i was a scholar la. <laughs> sia scholar oh scholar yeah, scholar yeah. so you're working in the office yeah i was working in the office yeah. so like when i graduated in 2009 i really wanted to stay in the us and i even asked sia can i just get one year to just do something they're like nope you start in three weeks i was like oh fuck so i came back and like i mean i will never fault them because they made my opportunity made my studying in the u.s possible like there was no way my family could have afforded it so i already knew that okay i'm not gonna break my bond because uh i know people who really wanted a scholarship but couldn't get it and they would be totally okay with the bond and i knew i didn't want to go into uh like finance or something so if i broke the bond there'd be a fuck ton of money to pay back la. so i wrote it out and the good thing was the bond was four years la. So no, I was at SIA. Yeah. Um, SIA for the first two years, I learned a lot what not to do as a boss, what not to do as a manager, <laughs> what not to do as a colleague, which was a great learning experience. But you still, then why you still do it? Huh? Yeah. Why do you mean why I still do it? And why do you still take on Terrence, man? Fuck it. Yeah, we did. take it offline. Huh? We did. take it offline. I say, <laughs> wow, you're like, wow, you must be the perfect boss, perfect colleague, perfect everything. What I you am what? I'm like, what? <laughs> Four years as a privileged scholar. Can you imagine how how much worse I would be if I didn't go through those two years? Uh, then after that two years, I found some way to be part of the team that started Scoot. And that was the first time I got a taste of starting something from scratch. Mm. Oh. And that was a great experience because it was funded by SIA. Yeah. Um, and I would join as the ninth member. Uh, I was with all the other heads of department. And I was the young punk who had to handle social media and all that. Like. That is how I got my taste in social media. I was like, oh shit, there's something happening in that. Because that was 2011, 2012. Uh, I'll give it to you. You you have no qualms about like getting your hands dirty to start doing stuff. Oh, okay. That one I will give Thank you, you. Terrence. (laughs) After you shit on me, then you butt me up. No, because you were like, oh, I'm I'm such a great boss. I'm a great colleague, great employee. I'm fucking... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you, you 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 did paint yourself out yeah. to be this wonderful human uh, yeah. after after just two years at SIA. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. I don't know what you all interpreted by that. You know, I was just humbly talking about my two years. <laughs> then after that, four and a half years, then we started doing this whole content thing uh as as a as a full time thing. Yeah. So but I think yeah, like also entering media when you're older, I found it beneficial for me. I can't imagine going in it when I was younger. Uh, because it took me a, a long while to build up confidence in the media sphere. Yeah. Um, and I think it, earlier, you know, when you are less less aware of your values and principles, I think it's a lot easier to get like massaged into someone that you might not really be. Mm. Yeah. So yes. in some way, in some way, I think starting older was good. Or maybe that's just what I tell myself so I don't regret not starting any earlier. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. I, 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 I think it's very true, and 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 I think it's it's true also not just at the individual level, but but in terms of uh, media outlets as well, right? Mm. Because I, I, I see a lot of new media outlets being very led by you know, uh, base metrics like Whether it's eyeballs yeah, or, yeah, or whatever exactly. engagement and things like that, and 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 I think that sometimes when you're not when you're not sure what your core values are. And what you you're really about it, it's 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 tough like You get dragged all over the place. Yeah, because so, I mean, yeah, like like I mean, right now if you want to do media and art in Singapore, yeah, it's not the easiest. You just need to constantly grind away at it, lah. But but and like if yeah, if you're swayed by numbers, then you might end up creating stuff that you, yeah, it's the balance, like It's the balance. Uh, mm. uh, and I think yeah, understanding the kind of content we wanted to create. 
Thankfully, we found ways to stick to it. It's still a lot more work to go, but yeah, it's it's the it's the long haul. Okay, so so now we just take a little sidetrack into some questions from our listeners because we did put a post saying that we are, we're having a podcast with you. So one question from Dr. Jenny Lee, who is a mm. frequent listener of Yala, but she said she has a question for Sudhir. Consider Singapore is marketing itself as open and we are ready to do business with the world, but internally the nationalism is at an all-time high, especially after the pandemic. How is the next PM going to balance the need to loosen up immigration to be more open to the world and the internal struggle of nationalism? So yes, uh, Prophet Sudhir. <laughs> I, so, so, so I think, you know, we need to, for any question like this, we need to come back to a basic existential geographic tension, mm. which is that Singapore is the world's only global city mm. come sovereign state. Mm. Okay. Mm. All other global cities are not sovereign states on their own. So, mm. you know, Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, New York, whatever. Mm. And and the reason I bring it up is because there are so many natural tensions here. A global city naturally wants to be open to foreign labor, to foreign capital, to foreign companies, everything. Mm. A sovereign state, by definition, needs to prioritize the interests of its citizens and its subjects, mm. right? Mm. And 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 these two often come into conflict. And in Singapore, they they you know you can you can talk about them coming into conflict in terms of national service, army, mm. right? Mm. Um, other global cities don't have to dedicate huge chunks of land for for your army guys to train, mm. right? Mm. Uh, other cities, global cities, don't have to dedicate. Uh, don't don't have to figure out how to make yourself sustainable in terms of food. Singapore mm. has a thirty by thirty goal to mm. have thirty percent of our nutritional needs by twenty thirty. Mm. You know, other global cities don't have to think about these these basic survival things mm. that Singapore has too, because we're also a, a sovereign state. Yeah. yeah, and most clearly, you see this tension when it comes to immigration. And I, you know, unfortunately, I think. Uh, the the bad news for Dr. Jenny Lee. Uh, yeah. For the bad news for Dr. Jenny Lee is I I don't see this um, getting better anytime soon. Mm-hmm. You know I I I think uh, when I say uh, getting better I I don't think the tensions, the the nationalism, the xenophobia, all all these things that we've seen come to the fore right over the past few mm, years. Yeah. I don't think they're going to get better anytime soon because we we've had a twenty year period of high immigration. Uh, 20 plus period year of high immigration where a lot of Singaporeans uh, justify, justifiably or unjustifiably believe that uh, they they haven't had any control or say in migration. Mm. You know, most citizens of a country should have a say in, in migration about who to let in, uh, how many to let in. And, and I think a lot of Singaporeans feel a bit disenfranchised from that whole process. And I think that, that that's a cause for a lot of the angst. Yeah. And um, I don't think it's going to get better anytime soon because I don't. The, the PAP doesn't really have a plan, you know. Or, mm. or many people suspect they do have a plan, and the name of the plan is ten million, <laughs> but, mm. but but they keep they keep denying it. And now we we don't know what the truth is. We don't know what the truth is, um, you know, in terms of their planning and building. Yeah. But what we do know for sure is that the ordinary person just feels so distant from the the process about. What's the makeup of my country going to be? Yeah, and yeah. and and I think that's the cause of a lot of tension. I, I as a Singaporean, don't know what we're doing in terms of our population. Mm. Mm. You know, whereas in every other country, because you have a, a more mature political scene, different parties with different different immigration plans, yeah, uh, different media channels talking about different immigration plans. You know, Singapore, we just don't have that. So you know, mm. th- there's this like. Uh, you know, people are just walking around blind almost when it comes to immigration, and because of that, you know, unfortunately, that's not the only reason. You know, there there are many reasons why we've got tensions in society today, mm. but 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 I don't see it getting better anytime soon. Yeah. And I I hope over the next five to ten years that our political parties, not just the PAP but the WP and everybody else, can can kind of like encourage you know more sort of. Uh, uh, holistic dialogues with with people in in, in Singapore about this because it's an important question. Mm. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. 
It's, I mean, a, it's a very important question. Just just over the weekend, wasn't it? The Dyson, the boss of Dyson, suddenly his residency is now back in the UK. Yeah. Then they had to clarify, oh, it's, so is Dyson now headquartered it's still in Singapore yeah, or yeah, UK? Yeah. And everyone's like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. did we just open our arms up for him to build an electric car? Then yeah. nothing happened. Then now he's back in the UK. So Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that was an interesting conversation because uh, Dyson, I think, wanted, wanted guarantees from the... I mean, among other things that were going on, he wanted guarantees from the British government yeah. that they weren't going to tax the employees going over there oh. at British rates. To because, help make the masks or something. Yeah, yeah. Because right? uh, they, they wanted yeah. to move Dyson employees back there to help them make the ventilators, ventilators or masks ventilators, or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted... So, I mean, there's a lot of tax arbitrage going on all over the world, mm. right? Uh, Dyson moving its headquarters here. Yeah. Different people wanting to move to Singapore, their funds, you know, there's a lot. And 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 if you look what uh, Biden is doing in the US now, you know, I think governments around the world are clamping down on tax arbitrage. Mm. And, and in my opinion, you know, in the long term, that's something Singapore needs to stop doing as well. I mean, we... we stop clamping down on... No, no, no. We, 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 we need to stop um, holding out tax carrots yeah. uh, to get companies and people to move here i mean there, there are lots of other good things about being in singapore that mm, that that mm. we you know we 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 need to be holding out as a reason to move here mm, you know mm, yeah. not we, we we shouldn't get into the tax arbitrage game you know hong kong cuts its income tax by one percent or we cut it by two percent you know i I, mm. I don't think we we need to play that game anymore mm. there, there, there was an argument that we may have needed to play it in the 60s and 70s and 80s yeah, when we were building now, up. You know, yeah. I, I don't think in today's world we need to play that game anymore. Mm. Oh, that is interesting. We're the most COVID resilient country in the world. Yeah. yeah. Come here anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that can be the STB tagline. Uh. Yeah. It should be a right. face of STB. Uh. Yeah. That's <laughs> 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 cool, cool. Okay. Um, then the next question from J underscore Edgar on our Reddit. Um, he is super, has been a fan of Sudhir's writing since he's floating on a Malayan breeze. Um, and he did say he's eagerly anticipating your book on China and India, which you have mentioned a few times. Um, so, would be great to get an update on that. Is that still in the pipeline? <laughs> <laughs> wow, they're calling you out, man. <laughs> Put him on the spot. <laughs> dun, 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 if those of you not watching the video, like Sudhir is like, he has his, he has his hands over his face. Yeah. Like in shock. It like, was, that that was, was, that was, that uh... was... That was almost as stressful as Terence asking me when, <laughs> when I'm going to become a politician. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, 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 so, so first, that, that, there's a running joke, which is not a joke so much for most authors, lah, but which mm. is like, don't ever ask me about the book I'm working on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because, because, because authors are notorious for taking a hell of a long time to and, and getting very stressed out when anybody asks them about their book. This, mm, this, yeah. this is not just in Singapore, but it's, it's all over the world. Um, but you know, uh, thankfully for me right now, I, I I I don't get too bothered by that anymore. I I think I did that question did bother me a lot mm. when I was working on my first book, which is what uh, what's what's, the, uh, what's uh, J which, underscore which, Edgar, which is what J which is what J mentioned when when I was working on Malayan Breeze, which which ultimately took me eight years. I I used to get a bit irritated like, with that question, mm. you know, because it, it it would just like. It would spark off all these insecurities about my career choice and what I was doing and whether I was wasting time going to future and zoo on a Friday night instead of writing my book. You know, it just, it just, it just, like, you know, it just triggered so many things like that. That yeah. one, you know, how's your book? You know, people would just, yeah, yeah, yeah. and people would ask it innocent, you know, flattering, almost way sometimes. But for me, it would just. But now, now I'm a bit more uh, stable in my career, so it, it, um, update would be that. Um, I've just handed in a proposal, mm. which means that you know I, I've handed it in to this agent I'm working with, and we're we're, we're trying to get it sold. Um, so in the next three to four months, I should find out whether anybody bites lah. Mm. If 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 somebody bites, then you know I think the the wheels will be in motion, and 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 the next step would be like me finishing up the draft. I, I, I do want to go back to both countries. Mm. In fact, I, I was like looking at flights to India as recently as two weeks ago. Oh. Now I'm not anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially yeah. especially after I heard that that younger people are getting into trouble, yeah. man. You know, right? Getting we, into trouble because? I, I, I mean, because oh, yeah, yeah. COVID oh, yeah, is yeah, affecting yeah, younger people yeah, now. Correct, correct. Yeah, you yeah. know, it, it used to mostly, I mean, affecting younger people in, in a bad way. Yeah. 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 And, and that has got me a bit more worried. Like I used to be quite uh, you know, uh, 
not non non bothered by COVID, you know, so yeah. much. But but that's got me worried. Um, so I want to go back to both countries because I I think um, unfortunately it would be silly for me to release a book on India and China that doesn't take into account the post COVID world. Mm. Mm. You know, I, the the world has changed. Yeah. Whether we like it or not, the world has changed. Yeah. Um, I there has to be some commentary on the on the relatively good response in China mm. and the relatively bad response in, in India mm. and the reasons for that. Mm. You know, I, I, I can't just re- publish a book now that like my last story was in the pre-COVID world. Mm. You know, it's, it's just, it's out of touch. La. Yeah. So I, it, it, I mean, a, lo- a, lot of, a lot of my book has evergreen stories on spirituality, on politics, on women's rights. But I, I think I do need some some contemporary stories. So I, I'm not sure when I can travel again. I, mm. I, I hope to get a publisher sometime this year, but I will have to wait till I can visit right. oh, each see, country see. once again. Okay. And well, I have no bloody idea when that is, la, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have really no idea when that is. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping it's this year, but I don't know. I see. Okay. I so mean, anyway, yeah. uh, hard answer to the question. Earliest the book will be done is early 2022. Okay. Mm, okay. Okay. As in, as in, on a shelf. Yeah. Okay. That's the earliest. I mean, I mean, thank you for answering that because when I saw the question, I was like, oh, because I have felt it too when, like, say, we are writing for, uh, like a TV show or writing a pitch or something, and when people ask or like, even like, oh, you know, how's this project going? I also feel that exact same insecurities that you mentioned, like. So I, I appreciate mm. you answering it in a way that. Yeah, I mean, I think it was important that people also understand your your, your thought process and how you have evolved to to be to how you say uh, not not see that that question as like a because I used to feel that like hey, what are you poking at me, you know? Like, you add a lot of your own that. context to yeah, it, like, exactly. your yeah, social exactly. anxiety, yeah. Or that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so yeah. The, so. The, the other thing that I've gotten over, which I think is a is a very Singaporean question, is like I've kind of got you know early on everybody is like. Hey, how many books you can sell? Uh? How are you going to make a living as an author? Mm. Uh? Uh? What, how much are you going to price it at? Uh? What's your profit margin? You know, all, all these commercial questions, right? Yeah. Mm. Used to really bother me when I was mm. when I was earlier, much earlier on in my career. Yeah. And now, I, I actually, again, maybe age and, and confidence maybe, but I, I, I kind of have a more nuanced view of it, of, of it now. Like, part of me almost feels, and, and I think it's, it's not just Singapore, but it, it's any... A uh, very dynamic uh, entrepreneurial slash merchant place, right? Singapore has mm. been a trading city for you know two hundred years at least, and 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 I think there's there's this like kind of drive in people to be like sniffing out, you know, business or commercial opportunities everywhere. It's it's even like you know somebody we, we got a home chef who who whatever makes uh, makes pizza really well, and they'd be like you know somebody out there in the in the crowd would be like, hey, you you should sell, man. You should sell on Grab Food. Mm. Or you should you make a business out of it. Like people are very fast to convert things from from hobbies into you know businesses or commercial mm. ideas. And and now with my age, I kind of look at it in a positive light, like, You know, I, I I think that's just part of the. Of the dynamism of being in a in a in an entrepreneurial place, I I don't mm. look at it so negatively as I used to in my early idealistic mm. Burning Man days, where I was like, oh, you know, you're just some like money minded yeah. idiot, la, You know, <laughs> yeah. le- so le- leave leave me alone with my art, la, You know, <laughs> get out of my face. No, I I I kind of more nuanced view on it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That is cool because I think for me also it's evolved to in some way to that because also I think it's important people know that in media there is a lot of potential. It's not easy but it's not just doing for a... And one thing I fucking hate is like when I hear my mom say some auntie say, oh, you know, it's good Harish is following his hobby. You know, I'm like, fuck you, man. This is not just a hobby um, and it's just like I don't like people feeling that like. Um, so, but that's yeah. why when they ask yeah. about the commercial viability, I'm much more willing to answer now than I used to be. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. And, okay. in, and and in a way, it's a good thing. In a way, it's a good thing. Yeah, because yeah. that 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 pushes pushes you to think, yeah as, yeah. as long as you can get that happy medium, lah, of not yeah. of not being too affected. Yeah. yeah. Worst case, you just hey, auntie, how much you make? Ah, uh? <laughs> yeah. just yeah. kills the conversation. <laughs> <la>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, another question from our one of our most active redditors, Jungle Jimbo. So, um, so he had a oh he read the book as well. 
Uh, and just one of the questions that I thought was quite interesting. Okay, so you said, under what conditions would you be willing to bring Harish and Terence along with you? Uh, I mean, I was assuming that we will be welcome to on a on a road trip, la. Oh, a road trip. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah, yeah, yeah. I would assume the answer is a resounding uh, every condition. Burning man next year. Burning man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so it's almost 17 years since Sudhir's Malaysia uh, journey road, slash road trip. How different would you expect your interactions with the locals to be and their views with respect to Malaysia, Singapore, if you redid that same cross-country journey today? Assuming, I guess, it would have to be in like, I don't know, like taking aside COVID or maybe even you know, bearing in mind COVID, assuming the borders could, could, could happen, la. Could, could be open. Yeah. So let's assume I'm I'm the same person, so just externally mm, has yeah, changed, la, right? Yeah, yeah. So so assume um, I think I think Malaysia in some ways is uh, much more open today. Um, you know, I think I think so. When I went in two thousand and four, the whole question mm. of Bumi Putra rights and mm the Malays having, you know, this affirmative action program and having having preferences across society, that was that was just starting to get attacked in a in a big way. Mm. You know, oh four. And then it, I, I saw it carry on, you know, oh oh eight with the with the big election that they had a big election in oh eight where the ruling party lost its its two third majority for the first time. Mm. And and this Bumiputra issue was again a big issue. You had this group called Hindraf, the Hindu Rights Action Force that really came to the fore around that time. And so when 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 I was doing a lot of my research for the original book, um, you know, I think those issues were still very raw. And and I think today in today's Malaysia, you know, trying to have those conversations with people in a way will be easier because the conversations are not so raw. Mm. In a way, it might be also more. It might be tougher because people, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's in some ways now that people talk about it more. It, it's more politicized in a way, mm-hmm. um, and and it's become more polarizing in a way. You know, the the people who still want to promote Malay rights and the people who don't want to promote Malay, Malay rights. The 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 battle lines, the battle lines are drawn a bit more clearly now mm-hmm. in Malaysian society. So I think some of the conversations for me as a non-Malay. Because a lot of a lot of my discourse with with people I met would be around things like that, lah. You know, how, how do Malays get along with Indians? How do Indians get along with Chinese? Yeah. Uh, a lot of my book was 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 around things like that, uh, around Islam. You know, I, I I think in some ways those conversations, how they have evolved, will be interesting. Uh, mm. Like I said, I, I think in some instances it'll be easier, some instances it'll be harder. Now politics in Malaysia is much more complicated than it was when I when I was there. You know, there are a million parties now, and mm. they are like. You know, uh, enemies hopping from bed to bed. You know, different alliances, different coalitions. Uh, again, I, I I'm not entirely sure how that will affect conversation with with me in Singapore. Being a Singaporean, I suspect I suspect that um, relations between the two countries are not at their best right now. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think they are really chialat and really bad lah. But you know. So, I, do, I don't think they are their best. So uh, in 2004, well, I can't remember what the state of relations between Singapore and Malaysia was. It was okay. Then. I think in the early 2000s, there was, you know, Mahathir was, was talking a bit of nonsense and there were a couple of incidences, but it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't too bad. La. It mm. wasn't too bad. Um, but now, for a bunch of reasons, you know, I, I don't know how Malaysians feel about the 1MDB thing, mm. you know, whether they blame us because a lot of the money was being routed through here, mm. um, whether they blame us for any of that. Um, I don't know how they feel about the, the high-speed railway that's been now cancelled. Mm. So, you know, it's it's always a, a tricky situation and, and I, I suspect, I, I may be wrong, but... I suspect as Singapore has grown wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, which we have, um, that that uh, you know that w- one thing that Malaysians always have have long hated, and and I think it might have gotten worse, is the rich Singaporean looking down on them mm. <laughs> And and my suspicion from '04 till today is that it might have gotten worse. Mm. My suspicion, because the nationalistic Singaporean has a lot more things to be proud and happy about, right? Mm. 
I, you know, from 04, whatever whatever my political differences with, with Lee Hsien Loong might be, right? I mean, for sure, one thing that's happened during his tenure from 04 to now is that Singapore's role in the world has grown exponentially. Mm. Mm. You know, when, when we were in college True. and, you know, you, you, you talked to people about Singapore, the, the idea about Singapore is very different from, from yeah. what, you know, mm. Um, was it is it a small island part of China whatever you know okay. in, in today's Not world know, and, right? and 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 you know because of, whether it's because of the casinos whether it's because of of the F1 night races whether it's because of crazy rich Asians I I don't know why lah but mm. but but for sure mm. Lee Hsien Loong and the PAP have have had this effort to like raise Singapore's prominence in the world yeah and, and mm. they've succeeded now there are all the negative externalities about cost of living and inequality and all the other things we can talk about immigration. Yeah. But they have to succeed it. And I suspect, coming back coming back to this this guy's question, I suspect that has made Singaporeans even more sombong when they mm. go to Malaysia. Mm. <laughs> I suspect. I, I, I don't know for sure. Yeah. I don't know for sure. I mean, Malaysia and, and, also became yeah. world famous for different reasons. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> so, so, so I suspect when I go to... In fact, for many... For many Singaporeans, I mean, they, they, you know, Malaysia is not even on their radar anymore. I mean, mm. it As wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't even really yeah. when I was going. You know, I, I go there because I have family, but I think even less so now. I mean, mo- most Singaporeans I know, they are, they are, they'll be much more familiar with uh, Bangkok, with Tokyo, Bali, Bali. Uh, you know, you ask them what they know about about I don't, I don't know, man, KL or Penang. I mean, it's, it's like I remember a few years ago, my a bunch of my friends were like. Oh Penang, let's go to Penang, exotic destination. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. suddenly, what? suddenly yeah. flash on their radar. So I, yeah, I, I, I suspect there could be this little bit of uh, spite within Malaysians about the Sombong Singaporean. Mm. I guess just as long as you don't bring up Nasi Lemak lah. Yeah. yeah, because back then also there weren't as many fights about the food and all, right? If I if I recall. Uh, a little bit lah. A little, oh, little bit. A little bit. Oh yeah, sorry. The other thing I forgot is that. They love talking about the exchange rate, lah. Oh. And the exchange rate was better back then. Yeah, yeah, a lot better. Yeah, a lot better. So now might be might be bad, man. Bad not as not as welcoming <laughs> towards you, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I see, I see. Okay, yeah, those were the the main main questions that stuck out. Uh yeah. So so right now we come to our final segment, the one shock thing of the week, and we've given you a heads up. But even then, we will maybe we go first, lah, um, and then you can you can round it off with your one shock thing, uh. Okay. So, um, uh, Terence is adjusting the camera, so I will start first. Yeah. <laughs> so my one shock thing for the week is um, I recently started on the first episode of the Kominsky Method. Have you heard of it? Oh no, it's I the, saw it. I saw it, but I haven't seen. Yeah, it. it's a Netflix show starring uh, Michael Douglas, and it's about this. This acting coach, uh, Kominsky, he plays the guy, and it's and he's an old guy, and it it's kind of about how him and his old friend navigate being old and approaching death and all. And when I watched it, because my girlfriend suggested it, um, I was like, uh, okay, sounds interesting, but I really fucking enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, and and I thought it was a very, it there's no special effects. It's one of those that is just based on the dialogue, the acting, and the characters. And I must say, for me to like it, it took a lot because I've always held a vendetta against uh, Michael Douglas for stealing Catherine Zeta Jones from me, um, <laughs> And and for me to like uh, something that he is in is a is a monumental uh, step, la. So I've only watched one episode, and I was like, oh fuck, this is so cool. And yeah, it's been a while since I watched one episode of a show, and I was like, oh shit, I'm definitely gonna watch this, la. So I highly oh, recommend it. Have yeah. you watched Wall Street? No. Oh. Huh? I quite you like Wall Street, Wall Street too. You mean ser- the series or a movie? Movie. Movie. The, the very old movie. Michael no, heaven. Yeah. Oh, Michael Douglas also, right? It's good, it's good. Yeah, that was pre-Catherine Zeta-Jones. Pre, pre. Mm. Pre-Catherine Zeta-Jones. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's my one shook thing. Yeah, my one shook thing is also an old movie. I just caught Kramer versus Kramer again. Oh. Uh, don't know. I mean, I mean, mentioned it before to you. Mm. It's a story... Starring Dustin Hoffman and a very, very young Meryl Streep as a young couple who enter a divorce and then they fight for custody of their child. Uh. So, so um, it's just, uh, the, I think the movies of that, that whole period, the late 70s, early 80s, they all had um, all have a message to it. Like, you know, even if you watch like Rambo or the first Alien mm. or something like that, uh, you'd, be, you'd be damn surprised that, that like first Rambo was really about 
about um, how how America was treating its veterans from the war, PTSD issues and st- stuff like that. You see, I mean, there was action also, yeah. but there, there were political undertones. So yeah, yeah. So, so the, just watching something like Criminal versus Criminal, I was like, wow, this is it, it's uh, available on Netflix, and it's uh, I mean, it's all all the movies from the era have a lot of heart, lah. So I I wouldn't spoil it by talking about what it's about and all, but uh, if you have a chance to, and you're sick of all the very slick new shows coming on Disney Plus, mm. the next Wanda Vision or whatever. You know, you want something a bit more, just a good story, <laughs> good acting, young Meryl Streep, everything. Uh, yeah, go check out Kramer vs. Kramer. Kramer vs. Kramer. Yeah. Cool. Um, and now hey, the, the the mic is on Can I do two shock things? Uh? Uh, can you yeah, be can, overachiever? Can, 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 yeah, can, 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 can. Yeah. No, no, no. Because I, since you're talking, I, I really enjoy the... I mean, because my other shock thing is not really a shock thing, la, but mm. I, I really enjoyed Nomadland, which I just watched. Oh, oh that's the one that the, the best movie, Asian... Best director, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chloe and, Zhang. And, yeah. and it's such a powerful story um, about this moment that we're in la, in terms of uh, job dislocation, job mm. insecurity, mm. And, and the way the way communities shift uh, yeah. depending on corporate forces. That, I mean, mm, that, yeah. that, that, that's all I want to say on it. And, and, and also... You know the actress uh, Frances McDormand. I, I mm. I've loved her since uh, I watched Fargo. You know, yeah. and and, mm. and uh, which I think is when she won her first Oscar, okay. if I'm not wrong. Mm. But anyway, uh, and she's now she's now won three Oscars uh, with with Nomadland. Yeah, and the yeah. writer director is super young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's writer director, Chloe Zhang, right? Chloe Beijing Zhang, yeah. born. Wow. Uh, and it's interesting because you know the, I I I think um, within China. I, I heard that that Nomadland is not going to get distributed, or 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 they or they or they they you know official channels have shut down discussion of 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 Chloe Chloe Tang right I think that's oh, her yeah, name yeah, Chloe, Chloe Tang uh they've shut because uh you know I I think she's Beijing born but then she you know did like uh, elite private schools then you mm. know moved to the U S and and apparently she's talked shit about China before la, so mm. the the Communist Party isn't very happy with her but yeah, yeah, but yeah. but she's got fans she obviously has fans in China yeah. Yeah. so. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting story in that respect as well. Oh, so my, okay. my other shock thing, my other shock thing, which yeah. is... Bring uh, it on, Sudir. <laughs> is uh, <laughs> this, uh, our Singapore's latest YouTube star. Ah, uh, yeah. I forget her name. Do you guys remember her name? She's the she's the lady who's been broadcasting for five years. Yeah, yeah. About, you carry on talking, I'll, I'll pull it who's up. Who's been broadcasting for five years. Essentially, I... I consider it kind of like entrapment in a way, lah, like like mm. sabotage in a way, because she she goes around these these uh, MRTs and and she like picks on so a Chinese yeah. lady, middle aged Chinese lady who yeah. picks on Malay or Indian guys yep. and accuses them of like molesting her or or harassing or, her, or harassing yeah. her in some way, lah. Yeah, and yeah. and at first I didn't think much about this, but but you know, um, I think all of you should make this one of the things you see. Like, like I said, I, <laughs> I don't know whether I'd call it shock or not, but, but you know, Mothership has an article on this and, and you can access the video, um, one of the videos of this lady, yeah. because I think her, her account has been taken off, but you can access one of her videos where she she's kachowing this Malay guy, this older Malay guy. Yeah. Do, do, do you have a name? You, you want a name? Uh, no, so oh. the article doesn't mention her name. Oh, okay. The channel is named after her, but the channel ha- on YouTube has been taken down. La. But there are uploads of the video on Twitter and all that. Yeah, so you can you can see that video. And what a couple of things amaze me. Firstly, first that she's been broadcasting for five years, mm. right? Mm. And uh, when you watch this video, you know, a couple of things jumped out at me in the video. You know, it's it's the the way she aggressively talks at this guy. Uh, she mentions CCTV cameras. She's trying to scare him. She halfway through does something that that you know minorities in Singapore face all the time, and I think uh, Chinese often don't realize. Mm. She starts speaking in Mandarin to somebody else on the train, mm. talking about this guy. So, you know, that that that's another way of instilling fear in somebody, right? If, 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 you're, in, if you're in a situation where the majority race suddenly starts talking in mm. their own code, mm. in a language you can't understand, that's, yeah. that's a very, uh, it's a very aggressive uh, mode of, of communication, right? Mm. Um, and she, she, she then... Um, says something to the effect of uh you know you're a malay and i'm a chinese you know how can a malay touch a chinese or how can a malay disturb a chinese 
you know so mm. so racializing the whole thing as opposed to just saying you know mm. don't attack me i'm a woman you're a man right it, it becomes a very racial thing plus it becomes a religious thing she mm. starts wacking islam mm. you know she she says something to the effect of you know did islam teach you this yeah so so you know when, when i see this 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 short video and that's why i say all of you should see it you you realize how depraved uh, deranged uh, just fucking crazy and and uh, terrible this woman is mm. right and the fact that she went around trying to you know sabotage indians and malays right and mm. and, and 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 for me like one of the most powerful things was that you know this concept of chinese privilege now mm. i'm i'm I can't decide whether I like the term or not, you know, and the reason I don't like it is because it, 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 it's it been borrowed from white privilege and, you know, then it gets bastardized and different people shit yeah. on the term and all that. But but this idea that, that Chinese in Singapore somehow uh, have advantages, have benefits in society, I think it's, it's super clear in this video, you know, and anybody who doubts the concept of Chinese privilege, even if you don't like the term, anybody who doubts the concept of Chinese privilege should watch this video and just imagine if the races were swapped. Mm. Mm. Imagine if it, if it was a Chinese, if it was a Malay or Indian person making these horrible accusations against the Chinese. Would they be able to broadcast their, their stupid videos for five years without anything happening to them? Mm. Mm. And and the other comparison is is I like to make is to the is to the sovereign lady, right? There was you know yeah. last year during COVID there was this. Slightly cuckoo Indian lady who 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 went around, you know, saying I think that she didn't want to wear the mask or didn't want yeah, to f- yeah, follow follow social distancing or whatever, and 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 she had you know two or three incidences, um, and I'm not a fan of the sovereign lady, but I mm. think I want people to consider, just just think about what happened, you know, the the sort of internet shitstorm that happened after the sovereign lady videos came out mm. and 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 what she was doing was relatively nothing compared to what this chinese lady is doing mm. this chinese mm. lady who's sab- sabotaging malay and indian guys mm. and you know the 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 reaction to the indian sovereign which was crazy and the relatively small reaction to this chinese lady who's mm. been broadcasting for 5 years for, for me there's there's no better example of chinese privilege Mm. But isn't the isn't the isn't there some rumblings that this lady is like, I mean she's mentally disturbed and and everything like, because I mean I watch her videos also and she goes just rambles on about oh you know like last time my neighbor tried to force me to marry someone and you know you are not like Bala Bala has a university degree I then see. I will marry so she definitely has something wrong in her okay. mind la. And she just keeps repeating this uh, ad nauseum, you know, and just talking to herself. So, I actually, when I saw it, I my thought was more that this woman needs help, lah. Um, uh, what what surprised me was how coherent the when her captions in the YouTube videos were. She said, "Oh, very clearly, oh, you know, this person is harassing me, and then it, I, I'm trying to find something incriminating." And uh, so, so she she uses words that you wouldn't expect someone who mentally disturbed is using, but. And she's, and she's from Hua Chong Junior College. Yeah, she, she emphasized right? that a lot. Apparently, right? And she went to a Canadian university. And then there's only people with qualifications like that and above can talk to her or marry mm. her. But but I felt like um, maybe everyone jumping, I mean, whether it's doxing her or putting her out there, um, also maybe should also consider whether she is like just nuts. Uh. Fair enough. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is the most sophisticated one shot thing ever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because yeah. it's, watch it's No Man Land, yeah, yeah. yeah, starring <laughs> Francis McDormand, <laughs> and, and and the YouTube channel of Beyond. <laughs> no, so, so I guess no. like you brought it up because it was thought provoking, like it was thought provoking yeah, yeah. in in some sense, <laughs> right? Um, or you just really enjoyed the video? <laughs> no, 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 because I I I think it's it's sometimes hard to describe. And so, sorry, let me yeah. just respond to the mental health thing. It, you yeah. know, Terence brought up for sure. You know, if, if there's a mental health issue with anybody, you yeah. know, I I, yeah, I, yeah. I think we need to show a lot of compassion for that. Mm. For sure, as a society, yeah. society, and and we're, we're we're so far behind from showing sufficient compassion to that. Um, but but for me, it was just that you know, there's this whole there, there's so much doubt over the idea that. Chinese as a majority mm. race mm. might have benefits in this mm. country. Yeah. And 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 I just felt this was a kind of an easy 
thing to just show that 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 mm. it's true, which is why mm. it's you know it just just occurred to me. You know, yeah. with, with the sovereign lady, you know, so quickly you had people doxing her, doing all kinds of things to her. Yeah. yeah. Because she also ha- was, I mean, there was some talk of her also having mental yeah, issues, I mean, that, right? But but yeah. remember we spoke about this person, this uh, this supposed Karen from New York, yeah. Who there was a, I think there was a, a uh, black man who was birding in oh, New York yeah. Central Park. Yeah, right? yeah. That's a good yeah. video. Then yeah. she went in and said, you know, all oh, this man's harassing me, and she she's recording video of him and vice versa, right? Yeah. <laughs> so she, so the scary thing there was that. It was so obvious that she was using instruments of the state, which yep. she knew would yep. be in her favor because she's yeah. of a majority race and everything, to threaten the guy la, over yep. a small argument about whether she was leashing her dogs, right? Mm. So I guess what you're saying is that this incident here also reminds you of how this woman is she's recording everything and she's like almost like baiting the person to do something or or, or say something that, that can be used against him, la, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see I see I see where I see where you're what what I see why it's your one joke thing. Like, it definitely does provoke thought in like, oh yeah, what if it was a another race or, or something yeah, like that? She, yeah, she, yeah. She, I, I'm sure if it, if it was the other, if it was the races were swapped, this person's account would have been taken down mm. or, she, or she or he would have had to stop doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe I'll try that next week. Eh? Yes. We just go on the train. Hey, let's test it. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's use today's one shock thing and test it out, man. Yeah. So next week, Terrence and I will both go on the train and yes. we'll upload yeah, videos yeah. and see. If anything happens, I'll just run out. I'm Chinese. I'm Chinese. Yeah. He's, he's with me. He's with me. He's with me. <laughs> hey, how come why you run away from your... Yeah. <laughs> then people will be like, oh, look at Terrence. So noble saving this, this clueless Indian boy. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe we'll try. Yeah, it. maybe we'll yeah. try it. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, but cool. So, so I mean, like, like, uh, I mean, we have spoken a lot about your writing and your 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 thoughts on media. Now, where can people find you to find out more? There's yeah. your website, sudirtv dot com. Yeah. yeah. Twitter. Twitter. I'm not very active, lah. I'm I'm hoping one day in the distant future to get into it. And I'm, Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Uh, Sudir Thomas Varakit. Yeah. Okay. I'm, then I'm TikTok. Quite active. Instagram. Sudir TV. Uh huh. TikTok. Mm. TikTok. I can't datang. I can't. But you booked uh, book the handle for, already or not? You booked the handle already or not? Oh, no. I, should I? <laughs> yeah, you should, bro. Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Start a, oh, do a dance. This? Do a dance. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe the... the maybe I mean, it's taken. Maybe yeah. it's taken. Then you have to just be like, hey, Sudir. Or like, <laughs> it's Sudir. Or the real Sudir. Yeah. The real Sudir. The real Sudir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, and we'll put all the links to those in the show notes. Oh, and mm. I have a Telegram channel too. Oh yeah, for for what it's worth, I mean, it was cool. it was funny La- last year. Some younger people told me they don't like to use Facebook because they feel they're being tracked on Facebook. Mm. So I I so the Telegram is Sudir TV. Oh shit, I forgot, man. <laughs> 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 bro, give you a plug, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if someone searches Sudir TV, I think TV, it's Sudir's. You know, yeah, they should find. <laughs> they should find. Out. Okay, we'll put a link yeah, in put, the show notes. Put in the link, lah. Yeah, 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 I'll yeah. give you the link later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, like my, like an uncle, no, you Sudir. <laughs> okay, yeah. but cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks so okay, much. Friend. Yeah. Thanks so no, much no, for no, joining thanks, us. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. The the next it time 